It's a Friday, the last working day of the week. Welcome to the AM News here on the AM Show. My name is Bakwisi Shandov. To the very first story, Parliament agrees to set up a bipartisan committee to further investigate the police shooting incident at the Islamic Senior High School in Kumasi last month. The incident, which left over 30 students hospitalized due condemnation with Parliament, taxing its defense and interior committee to go on a fact-finding mission. The report recommending a bipartisan committee was unanimously accepted by the House. Parliamentary correspondent Kukwa Sante has more on the following report. The Defense and Interior Committee report faulted the police route control mechanism and their lack of tact in dealing with the students. This is unfortunate. The police is there to protect lives and property. They are all your children. And you don't, they have done nothing. The demonstration comes. We've been in school before. So if you are called to disperse the crowd, you are not supposed to go and, you know, shoot in the air with rubber bullets or live bullets and all that. Mr. Speaker, the headmaster told us that when he had the information, he rushed to the school and he asked the student body to go back to their classrooms or go back to their, their top dormitories. The police at that time, that is what we were told, forced the gate open and rushed in and started firing left and right with tear gas, rubber bullets and all that. It's unfortunate, Mr. Speaker. Minority Chief Whip Muntaka Mubarak berated the police for not learning lessons from similar previous incidents. The most worrying is the excessive force and like the committee itself found and how students were, were handled. And unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, we keep repeating the same mistake and we hope that we'll get a different result. We are still leaving this matter to the police to investigate and we expect that you come out with a report or a report that will be satisfactory. For an independent commission to be handling matters when it arrives between police and citizens, it's long overdue. Moving a motion for the adoption of the committee's report, Chairman of the Defense and Interior Committee, Kennedy Japan, also called for the sanctioning of the Urban Roads Director in the Ashanti region. Mr. Speaker, the committee requests the Minister of Roads and Highways, as a matter of urgency, provide pedestrian crossing and speed ramps to ensure safe usage of the road by both motorists and pedestrians. The committee therefore recommends that Parliament should set up a bipartisan committee to further investigation the matter to the latter. Ranking member on the committee, James Agaga, argued that the police cannot be allowed to investigate itself. The police, Mr. Speaker, have been fingered in this matter for using gratuitous force in controlling crowds made up of very young students. And so when you allow them to investigate themselves, Mr. Speaker, the end result could be that the investigation would be skewed in a manner that is undesirable. Given the very dicey nature of this situation, members of parliament said the report of the committee was very important to them and took turns to debate its contents. According to the MPs, they were not so much excited about the conduct of the police in firing live bullets into those students. They also took time to criticize the urban roads department in the Ashanti region for failing to provide speed ramps in front of the school despite several requests by management. Majority leader of CHM and Sabonsu said he had no concerns about the House setting up a committee. And so he's expecting now that the committee's report has been adopted, that members from both sides will be presented to form a bipartisan committee to investigate this conduct of the police service. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I agree that we should have such um, a structure, an independent investigative body on the occurrence of such incidents to investigate the commissions or omissions of the police. But that is not to say that um, what happened um, and the reaction of the police commander, the IGP, should not be commended. Now, Health Minister Kweku Ajimameno has accused a former Deputy Finance Minister, Keso, at the forcing of authorizing payments to an ambulance supplier contrary to clear terms of the contracts. The minister 
told the High Court the contracts required that no payment should be made until the vehicles are delivered inspection. He explained was also to be carried out prior to shipping of the vehicles. Mr. Ajimamenu is the state's third witness in the case against Dr. Forsen and two other court correspondents. Joseph Akable has more in the floor report. Mr. Menu on Thursday continued with his testimony, which he had started on June 28. He explained that after the contract for the supply of the ambulance and all agreements had been signed, the then government failed to perform its obligations. Big C, the company taxed to supply the vehicles, he continued, wrote to the Attorney General seven notes of his intention to sue. Big C, he said, was unhappy that government was failing to undertake the pre-shipment inspection as had been agreed. The Attorney General's office, he said, wrote to the Ministry of Health, urging the government to perform its obligations to avoid a judgment debt. He revealed the Ministry of Health replied saying they did not have funds for the project. Mr. Menu said it was at this point that Dr. Forsin wrote to the Bank of Ghana asking that a letter of credit be established. This move, he insisted, was contrary to the agreement. The agreement, he explained, required payment to be made only when vehicles had arrived. He alleged that the first 10 vehicles arrived in the country shortly after but were found to be defective by the ambulance service. The health minister was then cross-examined by lawyers for Dr. Forsin. Lead counsel Dr. Abdulaziz Bamba questioned the minister on whether Dr. Forsen had simply made a request for letters of credit or authorized payment. He argued a letter of credit is not payment. He also suggested to the health minister that nowhere in Dr. Forsen's letter does he instruct the central bank. The health minister, however, insisted his understanding of the phrase urgent request is synonymous to an instruction. It was then pointed out to him that Dr. Forsen signed the letter on behalf of the then finance minister, Seth Tekwe. Dr. Bamba explained Mr. Tekwe has since confirmed authorizing Dr. Forsen to write the letter. The health minister said he was not aware. The case has been adjourned to Tuesday, July 26 for continuation of cross-examination. Now to some other stories. The DCE for Esikuma Odobin Brakwa Assembly has assured global partners to the implementation of the Giving for Change projects that the district would put to good use every investment made into the multimedia group's classroom project at Breman Jamara. This came up when the partners engaged him and the multimedia group on the progress of the project in the central region. There's more in the following report. Esikuma Odobin Brakwa Assembly is one of the two beneficiary communities under the Classroom Project Initiative by the Multimedia Group. It is a sub-project under the global initiative called Given for Change, spearheaded by the Star Ghana Foundation and the West Africa Civil Society Institute in Ghana. The objective is to promote social justice through voluntary giving and local resource mobilization at the community level. Multimedia's classroom project is aimed at rallying public support and provides safer learning environment for some 700 pupils in the central and northern regions. John New Senior Editor Fifi Kumsen and the classroom project lead MFI Etiamwa Eli led the team of Star Ghana's global partners to meet with the district chief executive of Isikuma Otobin Brakwa, Lawrence Edutia Isiang. The two, together with the DCE, briefed the delegation on the status of the project and its benefit to the people of Bremen Jamra. We have um, steel benders who are offering to support. There's a value there. We have the Forestry Commission giving us wood, about 50,000 cities worth of wood. Um, we have electricians coming in, we have tilers coming in, we have so, so many resources from different individuals, different companies just to support this whole uh, project and enterprise. The partners took turns to ask questions mostly about the significance of the project to the district and how the multimedia group is ensuring accountability to all donors and stakeholders. The DCE for the area assured the Star Ghana Global Partners that the district assembly will ensure that the investment is put to good use. God will bless you. I'm really grateful. But the assurance I'll give you, putting up the project is one thing, and utilizing it is also another thing. When the project is put to good use, I don't expect that the same thing comes to maintain it. It is my duty to maintain it. And that assurance I'm giving you, that whatever investment that is being made in the district, 
I am going to make sure, one, we put it to good use and then ensure a better maintenance culture to sustain the project. On a side tour of the seven space structure with the Education Directorate and the traditional leaders, the District Education Director, Emmanuel Panwon, told Multimedia the intervention by its audiences and donors to put up the school block will prevent further disasters in the community. He said the Education Directorate will give the necessary support to complete the project. This is a very wonderful project that uh, Multimedia and the Star Ghana have brought to Jamra, Bremen Jamra. And I must say that we are so excited because uh, we have serious deficit in terms of classroom infrastructure. So by bringing this project to Bremen Jamra, we will say that uh, we thank you so much and God bless you for that initiative. It will help us have our children in a very good uh, environment that is conducive for learning. Uh, not long ago, uh, about some five, six years ago, uh, there was a structure that broke down here and even killed some six people. So by bringing this edifice here, in fact, it is going to prevent disaster. Jan Sihene of Bremen Jamra committed to continue mobilizing communal labor to complete the project. Uh, on behalf of the chiefs and people of Jamra, I promise to ensure that this project is completed. I want to assure the multimedia group and its audience that their investment will not go waste. Posterity will not forgive us if we fail as leaders to provide the needed support to complete the school block. The Berman Jamra School Block is a three classroom unit with an ICT and library, a staff common room, and a headmaster's office. It has been funded by the cherished audiences and clients of the multimedia group. Among them are the Forestry Commission, DBS Roofing Sheet, Israeli Embassy, Dio Plus Ghana, Ghana Port and Harbors Authority, the Plant City Extension Project, Tropical Cables, and many more. The Star Ghana Foundation and the West Africa Civil Society Institute are lead agencies for the Ghana chapter of the Given for Change Project, with funding from the Dutch Foreign Affairs Ministry. Meanwhile, some basic school pupils of Otrikodia in the Trifo Ati Mokwa district of the central region refused to go to school because of their dilapidated classroom structure. It's not only the school pupils, but teachers who are posted refused postings. Speaking at a donation of dual decks, bags of cement, and other educational items by the central regional ECG Power Queens Club, head teacher of the school, Victor Andor, revealed that the lack of interest among school pupils and teachers has left the school with only three teachers who teach from KG1 to class 6. There's more in the following report. The mere sight of the classroom structure here at Ochikudia in the Chufu Etimukwa district of the central region demotivated the school peoples. Many stay home because they are mocked at by their peers in other schools. For the newly posted teachers to the place, they do not return to take up the appointment because of the school structure and the general school environment. Currently, three teachers have the honorable task of teaching from kindergarten one to basic six. We like the stakeholders and then the government to support us in our building so that the children will be happy. When they see the building, they will they, they become happy so that they because of the burden, sometimes when you when they, they, they are not coming to school, you visited them at the house, they say they are not coming. Some of them run away when they see you because uh, their friends and that from the other schools are teasing them about the burden. So they decide not to come at all and they stay at home. The head teacher of a Chikudia basic school, Victor Andor, says the school needs help to inject some confidence in the learning environment. 
we had some trained teachers last year. When they came and then saw the burden, they went without returning. That means our uh, the major challenge of the school. And then uh, that is the staffing. We have major challenge because we are only three running from KG up to classes. So that one is very, very uh, challenge to the school. We are waiting for this for a very long time. I quite remember the first day you visited our school. In fact, many people come, but we don't hear anything from them. But you came here for the second time, making us sure that uh, you, you will be in the help of the school. And today, in fact, the community, the staff, and everyone is happy for what you have done. For us. The Central Regional Power Queens Club of the Electricity Company of Ghana, upon an assessment of the situation, decided to donate some dual desk, bags of cement to undertake some innovations and other educational items. President of the Power Queens Club, Eva J, says the donation forms part of the club's corporate social responsibility and was initiated by their general manager, Engineer Emmanuel Ankuma. This um, plan was initiated by our GM, Engineer Ankuma Emmanuel. He is, um, uh, he is behind what we are doing today. He's been very supportive to this donation and we are hoping that this thing that we are doing will go a long way to inspire the children in order for them to learn hard to be somewhere they are expecting to be. Mm -hmm. There were so many schools that we, we, we went to do the survey. But the day we decided to go around the schools that we, we asked to do the survey, we came to Prasu here. And the way we see the children and the way we see the structures, even the teachers and the parents of the um, people, we were too inspired. In fact, we were even emotional about the structure and the children. And this inspired so much that we had to go and quickly come back. We couldn't have left this school to go for other schools. The chief of the community is excited, at least, there has been some support that would show up the interest of their kids in the academic activities. Reporting for Joy News, Richard Kwejonya Akon, Cape Coast. Now, Upper West Regional Minister Dr. Hafez bin Sali fumed over the late arrival of municipal and district chief executives and their coordinating directors to the Upper West Regional Coordinating Council meeting. The meeting, which was scheduled to start at 10 a.m., rather started 40 minutes after the slated time. Three MDCEs who came in late were locked out of the meeting. The MDCEs have since been queried. Joy News' Upper West Regional Correspondent Rafik Salam reports that two of the municipal chief executives went away while the others sat at the corridor of the meeting hall throughout the entire duration. You are not providing the same plan leaders. What sort of people are you? Come for meeting at 10 o'clock. It was only the chief who was here. Leadership is not for decoration. Leadership is not for decoration. A visible shaking and angered upper was with your minister, Dr. Hafiz bin Sali, did not take kindly to the refusal and late arrival of municipal and district chief executives, coordinating directors and heads of decentralized departments to the Upper West Region Coordinating Council's meeting. Before I proceed to give my address, I want to find out how many of the MMDCs are here. I've not seen one. Why is not here? Who else? What is uh, what was? She's not here. Yes, and I'm not allowed her in. Coordinating directors, how many of you are absent? Five. So six are not here. The program which was scheduled to kick start at 10 a.m. started 40 minutes after the slated time. I will not. I will not tolerate any insubordination. Right. I will not allow anybody to undermine me or undermine the government of His Excellency Nana Adedanko Kufuado. I will not accept that in the region. I am particularly disappointed in the MMDCs who are not here. We just re returned from Accra and these are some of the things the President talked to us about. Your responsibility is to lead your people. Notable absentees and latecomers were the one municipal chief executive Isaku Tire Moment, Wawa District Chief Executive Vado Dorote, Nadole Keleo District Chief Executive Catherine Lankono, and Jiriba Municipal Chief Executive Nicola Soiri. The irony of it is that the quadruplet late coming MDCEs have their municipalities and districts 
located closer to the meeting venue than their colleagues who reported earlier for the meeting. With the exception of the Wabas District Chief Executive, Vada Durete, who sat at the corridor of the meeting hall throughout the entire duration, his opposite numbers at Wa Jiruba went away after they were blocked at the entrance from entering by the security personnel. Dr. Binsali directed the chief director at the Upper Australia Coordinating Council, Peter M. Mala, to serve the deviant MDCEs with a query who they are expected to respond to by July 25. The Fiamma Bure is a district chief executive. Nadi Moro Sanda took some time off from his speech at the meeting to apologize on behalf of his colleagues for the lateness. Apologize to you, our dear chiefs, and everybody here on what happened this morning. I want to pledge or promise that it won't happen again. We are deeply we are sorry and it won't happen again. The regional minister, however, refused the apology and insisted on harsher sanctions should the situation recur. This is the forum for you to voice what is affecting your people. So if you decide not to use this platform, you'll be denying the people you are representing a lot. Henceforth, we're not going to tolerate this lackadaisical attitude to official duties. Reporting for the news, Rafik Salam. Wa. That's all for the news and thanks for your company. My name is Pakwe Sishandov. Do have a pleasant weekend. I live in the company of Benjamin Akapo and Benis Abubedu Lansa to stay. Thank you for staying with us all this while. It's a Friday, and uh, yeah, around this time we get into the newspapers. Wherever you are, thank you for making the time. And uh, guess whom the net just dragged in? A certain SKB. Mm -hmm. We have SKB Asante. Uh, Asante with uh, uh, Dine Chiana. No. Oh. This Maybe. is Samuel Kojo. Yeah, exactly. That's what it is. That's mm. what it is. Maybe mm. Enu could have been a hunter because I am a hunter. Do you and speak it? You know, I speak some time it. back, we had this, uh, one of our, uh, uh, you know, uh, colleagues from Love FM uh -huh. put together a piece on the yeah. Ahanta language and people who now yeah. trying to, you know, stop uh -huh. its death, so yeah. to speak, because yeah. very few people actually speak yeah, it. Yeah, do you speak yeah, Ahanta? Yeah. Oh, I do. I do. I was in one of the documentaries put together by Eyes of Fortune. Okay. Actually, Kweko was probably the first one. Okay. That time I was in the university and then Fortune came to do, uh, I think, one in 2017. Oh, yes, yes. I say so. Give, give us a little. So, for example, your in the morning, Melin Mamabo and Miss Mabemo Bahi, Bidemi Oson, Bimke Bon Dene, Yamamaza Veneva, and the Remo Amzimo Yeremo Yale, Yale, Amimo Koko, Yale, 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 Namumi. Okay. So, so, so all that he's been saying is that politicians no more hard. But you know, we're going to try to ensure that uh, everything Man. stabilizes as yeah. we deal with the issues this morning in the course of the news review. That's all he was. That's your to. that's your own understanding, and Absolutely. that's that's your own statement because everything I said was to greet my people uh -huh. and to tell them to do the right thing. Now nah, this, this is propaganda. Right <laughs> this is false propaganda. But that was that was good. That was good. Yeah, that but, was good. Um, all my life, I've I've tried to better myself in my in my identity. So mm. I speak my language. My kids do speak it. Mm. Although they are not too Congratulations fluent, to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's like composure. When you're in the home, you have to. Yeah. When you go to school, you speak English. When you come home, it's a hunter. So when you need anything, you have to speak a hunter before I can do it for you. We're, we're, we're proud of you for yeah. that feat. Yeah. But, but you see, while I, I really love you as mm. a brother, we ask for What did you Oh, there. Guys, I want you to shoot me. <laughs> Look at him. 
Now why yes? I mean, I'm not gonna say. So I do this, then you yeah, do I'm this. Say, yeah, I mean that's that's insane. I have to match up to the thing. Maybe mm -hmm. plate in it. I have to match up to the plate. I cannot let you give me too much gap. Yeah, two hundred. No more gap. But dressing, yeah, no, no, no. But but this is lovely. Uh, who 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 fitted you out? It's a uh, Attila fashion. Wow. Uh, Attila fashion. G H. Uh, young guy in dance man. Okay. They call it uh, there a cocoa photo also. Okay. So they're about yeah. Okay. Very young guy. He's called Kwame. I like him. I am usually fitted out by Catherine yeah. Gordon, but mm -hmm. today, today, this one, it's a freestyle, freestyle, freestyle. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's get into the papers. Oh, but uh, before we do, just, just in some 30 seconds, um, mm. do you know what I'm sharing my blunt thoughts on today? No. Share Wild guess. Um, will it be on the elections? Yes. On road. Smart guy. <laughs> so I've titled my blunt thoughts today. Expect that at around 7.20 a.m. Auctions or elections? <laughs> Manicracy or democracy? Uh, the nasty twists and turns of Ghanaian politics. Interesting. So do we have manicracy or democracy? Elections or auctions? Look forward to that. You don't want yeah. to miss it. What do you think? I concluded way back in 2012 in the university that we've lost it. Because in the university where you expect all of us to be level-headed and that we'll go for issues, it was money. It was who paid the highest money then. So I concluded that we've destroyed our politics. And because it was us, student leadership, uh, who were going to cross over into the politics, mainstream politics, I felt then we killed it then. There's no way we're going to redeem it. Our it politics will, it will be difficult. has it's died a slow, it's painful gone. death. It's gone. So today, if you have the right leadership qualities, if you have the right attitude to serve your people well, and you don't have the financial backing, forget it. You won't win any seat in Ghana. Unless the people themselves decide that. As for this time, we want this guy there. And even that, it will, it will take a miracle. Because everybody, in everybody's mind, it's about who can pay what. So immediately they know you want to come. They will start doing, oh, mm. my child's school fees here. I want to do this training. I want to do that. So if you don't have what you do, you sit in your corner and, and take care of yourself. Do you know something that's interesting? And I'll be expatiating on that when we get into our blunt thoughts for today, right before we get into the papers. Mm. At least the Nigerians, they mm. spend, but they have a cap. Mm. They had a cap of 2 billion naira, mm. okay, mm. up until uh, February this year. Mm -hmm. And then they increased it to 5 billion. Mm. We don't even have a cap. No. It's free for all. Mm. And we are yeah. spending 547 million Ghana cities. It's here. To become president. Yeah. This was even in 2016. So 2020, know, 547 million Ghana cities. To become president. It means that. Five, four, in, that was 2016. Million. So you can expect that that figure went up in 2020. Let's get into the papers. Let's check out the Ghanaian time. Shocking. Well. Let's start with the Ghanaian Times. Teacher union strike, academic calendar not affected. GS Director General assures. It comes to the picture of uh, Professor um, uh, Kwesi Opokun Amankwa, who is the Director General of the Ghana Education Service. Now, he says that uh, the school calendar for 2022-2023 academic year will not be impacted significantly by the two-week strike action embarked on by teacher unions across the country. He said as part of the measures put in place to ensure that the lost time during the strike action was recovered, regional and district directors had been instructed to liaise with the various heads of schools to put in some form of interventions for the students. But we're also being told that some, some students are not even going to school at all. You had that story from uh, Central Region where, because yeah. of the dilapidated structures, people are not going to school. So there, there are a lot of things. I mean, because there are fears, realistically. Exactly, yes, you yes. prefer death to... No, 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 no. It's more education we ah. want. You want but in the same to... region, yeah. about, uh, is it uh, two, three, four years ago, yeah, 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 some, yeah, yeah. some yeah. children, children, children got crashed. And it got joy if uh, joy news to try to... That project is yeah, still exactly. ongoing. Mm, right? So, yeah. Uh, again, National COVID-19 Trust Fund backs 62 million Ghana cities in contributions and donations. Yesterday, they accounted for us and show us, uh, showed us how they spent the money. Which of, which of them was shocking to you? Um, so, yeah, the, they gave, uh, there's they, PPE and a whole, and, and, I, I and mean, they, a list of 13, then later whittled down uh -huh. to nine. Mm -hmm. But me, you see, my whole point is, we can play around the figures. It mm -hmm. could be realistic that mm -hmm. we even spent all of that money on mm -hmm. PPE. But the point is, the breakdown, it's not about the, the overarching figures. Mm -hmm. It's about the breakdown. Mm -hmm. How many people did we give these mm -hmm. to? Mm -hmm. Where? 
Uh -huh. You know, some, some of them, I mean, they say, okay, we pumped it into this facility, COVID-19 mm -hmm. center, mm -hmm. this and all mm -hmm. of that. So, mm -hmm. well, we can do the cost benefit analysis and, yeah. and do the valuations. Mm -hmm. Did it really cost us this at that time, market price, to put up this, to do that? Those are the things we ought to be accounting for. That is else, that, else, if, mm -hmm. you know, let's say you, you are the people. Mm -hmm. You entrust 100 million CDs to me. And I come and tell you, oh, I spent the, the 100 million, I spent 50 million on PPE and another 50 million on maybe serving Ghanaians with hot food. Mm -hmm without a proper breakdown, mm. which is what we'd expect from mm -hmm. the mop-up of the figures across the country. Mm -hmm. What have you done? Yeah, um, I, I think that will be done by an auditor for them to audit those accounts see, and for audits, us to know the details. These audits, auditory things never mm. happen. That's why the Auditor General is always mm. two steps behind corrupt mm. entities mm. and people. Mm. Do you get it? Mm. Because in the end, they always do the thing. We're always uh, uh, reactionary. Mm. We're doing things post yeah. the fact. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. now that we have an auditor general who isn't even surcharging or doing the sort of things, and I'll that say Dome Dome was doing. that Dome Level was doing, mm -hmm. matters have, it appears we've retrogressed even further. So, oh, you, you, I mean, you, these things, it's a hopeless case mm. until we, we, we change the system. Because yesterday, when, when um, her ladyship retired, uh, uh, Sophia Kufu was yeah. giving those, those our, our, uh, you know, figures, I was, I was here asking myself, can we get the, the, the real I details so many questions. of, 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 so of whatever was being When, when you give across. me such figures, I don't know how to work with them. I like doing calculations. I like mm. breaking down, like you would see when I do my slides. And I like to break stuff down. Mm. No, what equivalent of this is this? What mm. is if you don't give us such figures, all you're doing is child's play. Really. Well, maybe time could uh, because I I had mention that details in the report, details in the report. Mm. So we'll get a report and then we'll, we'll see whether the details there. we anyway. Are um, for the, the sad news in the uh, Western oh. North region: mm. the any mine demonstration leaves six with gun gunshot wounds. Uh, they they were demonstrating over work that once mentioned gold was coming in the area, they are looking for the youth there to be employed. It's about time we, we probably have such discussions. For every entity, we know we have something called um, social buy-in. And that's, if a company sets up in, a, in an area, you would want the people there to welcome you, even though government and all the authorities have given you the authorization to operate. You also need to get that collaboration with the communities. So what you do, I think, uh, it's not even, I and mean, that's the standard practice, that you meet the communities to spell out your vision. You know, let them understand how things are, how they are involved. That's how you avoid these things. Because what has happened, the investor somewhere would feel jittery. And it's because somebody probably, I'm saying probably because I don't know whether they did that community engagement or did not, didn't do the work well. If you had engaged them properly, all these things could have been avoided. So it's about time companies do learn these things, that when you're going into a community, you don't move in there and start operating straight away because there are some people who will be affected by operations. If there's a blast, who are affected? It's by those who, those who are affected are those who are close to your operations. So companies would have to sit down with these uh, uh, people and let them understand. Probably the skill set. I'm suggesting they that, don't do these because I felt that was that was a. In that, fact, when you look at mm -hmm, the guide mm -hmm, guidelines when mm -hmm, it comes to mm -hmm, mining in communities mm -hmm. and all of that, I thought that was an integral part. That's of it. why I'm saying that maybe probably they did not do it. Look, the, I or I maybe tell, it wasn't done well enough. There was a there's a company which is about to operate in the Hunter West area. I'm not going to give details, but when I chanced on it, I was like, ah, since when did these people start here? Right. Who have they engaged? And you are very familiar with this. This, this, is, my, this is my area. Great. So at least, if you want to mine there, you know your operations affect more than one community, more than two, more than three. Mm. You have to meet these communities and tell them, we are coming in here. Uh, Someone would and even you see your, your, your outfit and immediately get apprehensive because the person mm. has no idea. Sometimes it merely yeah. takes reaching out to the chiefs and a few community mm -hmm. members, community leaders, mm -hmm. who also spread the word. You don't mm -hmm. have to meet with everybody. But sometimes, I would, I would even prefer, when it's about community engagement, move beyond the leaders. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, some people do not trust their leaders you have so a much. Point. You have a good move point. beyond them. Mm -hmm. Meet them. Mm -hmm. Have a discussion about the, the sort of things you're about to do. And even the skill set you need to get people in there. Because if you tell them that I need a phone repairer, 
and nobody in the community is a phone repairer. How would they come and attack you for not employing them? Yeah. Already you have told them that you need a phone repairer. Mm. So if they don't have it, they don't have those skills. You don't have what you skills, do yeah. is like, uh, I, I won't want to mention any, but one mining company did, did something in the area. They instituted a program to train people. To I've, I've heard the, of a few of those. Yes, to have the skill set to be employed. So when they train you, then they absorve you. That, that's, that, that, that's something that we have to be doing. Mm. You cannot just get up and go into a community to say you are going to be it, 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 so, so maybe mention gold, if they haven't done it. I'm, I'm not saying that they didn't do it. I'm just saying that if they didn't, then they have to probably. But we may say if they didn't like, did it. Uh -huh, then, uh, yeah. Someone will say they, they, they didn't did it. <laughs> they have to do something like that then, to, then to have it. Eh? Yeah, they should did it. <laughs> All, All right. right. Mm. Let's look at the Daily Graphic newspaper. Mm. Inactivity at the Ifwa Sutherland uh, Children's Park. Oh. Uh, Ifwa Sutherland Park loses shine. Gender Ministry says park not sold. You know, there have been lots of claims about yeah. the park being sold mm -hmm. and all of that. Uh, according to the story, there seems to be no end in sight to the deterioration mm -hmm. at the state owned Ifwa Sutherland Children's Park, the one time vibrant park strategically located in the heart of a cries on its knees. In its glorious days, the facility was a center of attraction for many families who sent. Um, their children there, especially on public holidays and weekends, to have fun. All, also, schools and various groups hosted programs such as the award-winning Italian uh, Il Florilegio or Florilegio Circus, fun fairs, among others there. However, for more than a decade, <clears throat> the one-time vibrant park has been left inactive. This is in sharp contrast to private parks in the national capital, which have been well-kept and continue to receive patronage. Uh, notable private parks and family centers that have taken the space in the region are the Bliss Family Center, Splash and Play, Kitty Ground, Kids Cottage, and the Play Zone. Of course, uh, you're roping uh, the, the, the tourism ministry and all of that. But again, like I always say, a pointer to how we let things deteriorate mm. yeah. and become yeah. despicably yeah. bad. I remember growing up, going to the Afua Sutherland Park, mm. having fun, doing stuff. You know what these could do for children? <sighs> these, you know what they could do for children? Child. I mean, th there's so much fun and learning they can get from play. I remember the first time I, what's it even called? Um, uh, I just forget the name. In Cuba, when I did the, you know that thing that, I've just forgotten. The tubes? Uh, yeah, you see those ones where through the tunnels and da 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 da, -da. Mm. It was, it, was, it was such a thrill. I mean, your heart is pumping, your adrenaline is rushing, but it's such a thrill. When you do these across the world, th there's a different feel <sighs> to it. But yeah, you know, especially as it is located right next to Kempinski mm -hmm. and not too far away, the Mervyn Pick Grand Hotel, not too far away, the Accra City Hotel. Can you imagine? Probably what we could be raking in from here. Oh, if I had money, I said some time back that if I had mm -hmm. money mm -hmm. as a private investor, I would have found a way of getting it from government, privatize it, and trust me, do you see what happens in Disneyland and other places mm -hmm. in, in the US and all of that? Do you know how many m hundreds of millions and billions they make every year? And look yeah. at all these experts coming in. We want tourists to come into the country. Mm -hmm. And this is your major, you know, children's park. But this should, this, okay, this, yes, okay, what, what <clears throat> this should get us to start thinking of <clears throat> as Ghanaians is our ability to destroy things that we build with our hands and resources. Oh, actually, to destroy things that other people, other people bequeathed to us, we destroy. Yeah, well, you see, but, but I, want mm. to, I want us to look at it in, in general, as, as in the whole Ghana, you know, as a people, that we build things, pumping money, and then we will sit down there and, and look on whilst the things deteriorate. I, I, I simply don't get it. Because people travel outside of the country to go and do these things, to go and, 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 and have fun on these things, have their kids patronize these things. So if they, we, they, and, they had and, access to that in Ghana, what why would, would they do? What, I mean, why would you want to travel if you have all of these things here? Last time my kids were coming over and I was, I was asking someone, where can I get a kid's a children's park for them to go? When we have these things which are deteriorating mm -hmm. and nobody seems to care, why? Ah, they don't care about these. I mean, but they care about chop chop. But that's 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 why I, I, I get I get so much disappointed in, in, in the whole Ghana agenda, really. That it looks like we don't have a goal. It looks like we don't know where we're going. 
we do watch on for anything to destroy, to deter it before we go and pump in money to rehabilitate. Why? Mm. Why do we do such to ourselves? Well, Look at how we watched on for the Sipon Stadium to deter it to the level it, it, it went. It takes media people I mean, I, to make a lot of noise. I, I don't, we, I, sometimes. Uh, we, 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 it should we, be I, someone's job to care, to love Ghana. Hmm. Such that when you see these things, your heart aches hmm. and you move in to ensure that the right things are done. Aren't we paying people who are supposed to be managing this? Uh, no, have, you, have you seen our parts and gardens? Half of them have been lost either to. People are actually taking over government land, state owned land, regime after regime. What? Tenure after tenure. Uh, Everything state is becoming private property. And whatever they deem state and feel state, leave it, let it rot. Yeah. Uh, I, I no country develops like that. Mm. Absolutely no country. No. But we are here claiming we want to develop. Yeah. <laughs> Look at our major national, you know, children's park. Amazing, right? And the gender ministry says what? I'm thinking, telling you, if, 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 about if we got this ministry. right, this, yeah? maybe could have prevented us from, you know, going for an e-levy. How much do we want? 4.5 billion Ghana seeds. Are you telling me if we got something like this right and did proper advertising, marketing, we wouldn't rake in more than... Five billion Ghana cities every year, and we are we are talking about turning the Achim Water Forest into an eco what eco park or so. We that, just we just we just that, love that to talk. That that we just love to talk without really uh, thinking about what 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 it needs for those things to be maintained and for them to really serve their purposes. Mm. You want to build an eco park when you have Air Force Island Park that is deteriorating. Mm. You build an eco park. But that's what you we do. No, you, you, we you, have, but we will not so, so, work on so, those. So, we'll start new so we'll, we'll pump in money to build eco park. Mm -hmm. But five, ten years down the line, it will still come back to the ruins that this, this is in yeah. now. Uh, two quick stories to wrap. Page 19. IMF cannot solve countries' economic woes. That's mm. according to Dr. Gamel Nasa Adam, uh, Vice President, Islamic University, Ghana. I agree with them to a large extent. And then review e-levy to 0.5%, Professor Peter Quarte mm. uh, says so. Do you have a take on, on these two matters? Uh, well, let's leave it. You, you have, want to hold your, yeah, your yeah, thoughts? Yeah, yeah, really. Uh, you... um, but the, he says the IMF will not develop Ghana's economy. Dr. Adam is saying that. He, he's saying that it's not the solution. Yes, I think it's not the, the solution to, to the, resolving our problems. The vice president made this known in his presentation. Yes, recent he, one. he made mention. He of said it. we've gone to the I, IMF more than sixteen times, isn't it? So this is the eighteenth. If yes. you get it. Now, every time we've gone there, it hasn't helped us solve the fundamental challenge. Because that is not why you go to the IMF. So it means that we know the solution. So we have to solve the fundamentals. Mm. Else, like he's saying, it's true. The IMF will not be our solution. If it was. Having gone there 16 but, times, look, more than 16 let, let, times, let, let, you will not be going there to, today. Are, are we going to work on the fundamentals? We still have, uh, after mm. I think 2014 or so, mm -hmm. we've always had budgets tied to the apron strings of the Bretton Woods institutions, mm -hmm. foreign donors. Yeah. You can't fund your own budget mm -hmm. in completion. In addition, you are import oriented. Mm -hmm. You are not exporting much. You are not building your industries. Mm -hmm. You don't have a stable economy. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what are you going to do with all of that. You will always go to the island. Wasn't that the reason why we brought in the 1D1F? And, and we said what? 1D1F mm -hmm. for where? Wasn't, wasn't that the reason? I, I, think I, I challenge, I, and, and I'm putting this mm -hmm. out there. I, I, I like dealing with facts and things. Mm -hmm. Let's put everything together and say, okay, so we claim we've we we'll have, have over 100 1D1F, factors. over 100, and da 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 da, mm -hmm. da. Okay, I know of Ekumfi Juice. They are mm -hmm. doing great stuff. Yeah. I see their stuff out there. A bit, mm -hmm. I mean, I'll say this, a bit sugary though. You should tone it down on the sugar. But no, I, I do they actually, but, they don't, I, I but think everything is natural. It, natural. It, it, it tastes rather, I don't know. You mm. look at the contents and, and come back to me. Okay. But the point I'm trying to make is the 100 and so plus factories, because some of them were refurbished, some were factories in existence, and mm -hmm. we said we had done this and that for them. Let's quantify how many, what are they yielding? What have they yielded for us, let's say, since 1D1F and all of that? If this government wants to show, those are the things they should be doing so that mm. people know, ah, okay. But nothing of the sort. Mm. But look, if we want to industrialize, 
the impact I see from mm. 1D1F is mm. not what we need. We need something much bigger on no, a much no. larger scale. I, I, I think that is a good start. What we have to do is to pump the money in the right direction. Because I, I know if that... If it's rice production... Yes, I was, I was coming to it. You can target. So because... Can if it's sugar, we mm. know. If it's rubber, we know. Yeah. So what, what are we... A, a, a friend of mine, but for 1D1F, he wouldn't have, you know, like started from where he did. Great. When the 1D1F initiative came, he knew he was already into rice. Mm -hmm. So he put up his proposals. Now he has a well-established factory in the Ashanti region, which is doing uh, quite okay. But he needs more investment. And I think that the 1D1F secretariat should be concerned right. with sustainability. Mm -hmm. So if I, get, I help this entity A to start, mm -hmm. how do I ensure that it is sustaining itself, producing more, such that we are substituting import, like we said. For example, rice, we have the capacity. We have the capacity to grow and eat here without importing even a single grain. I'll tell you something. Mm -hmm. The $25 million or so mm -hmm. that we are using as seed money mm -hmm. for the National Cathedral, yeah. when you put that side by side with mm -hmm. the entire commitment in yeah. 2022 for mm -hmm. 1D1F, mm -hmm. it's almost safe. So, so I so think. So, where that, are your priorities? So, I think, yeah. So, I think it's a do, good. Do you get the picture? Yes, yes, yes. So, it's a mm. good idea, but mm. probably the implementation is what we have to look at. We have to pump in more money because I see some of them trying to do a lot. I don't want to mention names, and, and, but and, but there are some and, that you, and, you and see along, al al along the this way. Government, mm -hmm. I'm putting it out there. It is trying to do too much at the same time. Mm -hmm. That is part of what, Maybe. and the economists will tell you that is Maybe. part of, of what is crippling the system. Maybe you're trying to do too many things at the Maybe. same time. Maybe. Free SHS, mm -hmm. one D one F, mm -hmm. uh, planting for food and, and jobs, jobs. Uh, agenda one one one. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know you are bleeding. Mm. Interesting. Uh, we have to have a broader conversation on how we can fund these things. Because I think that when we are successful at these, it would help us a lot. Look, my friend who, whom I'm talking about, he has employed a number of guys, myself included, you know, because I do other things uh, around it. So what, what it means is that if you help this guy to grow, look at the number of people that will be affected by his production. Again, will not be important rice because these guys, he and the other friends who also produce rice in Ghana, will be producing for us here. We didn't need to spend dollars in importing. So really, we, we, we have, we have just it. about some mm. three minutes. Let's make okay. the most. So uh, the time. Delhi guy says, Mills' family to exhume body for reburial. Hey. It's not that they are to uh, do so, but they are threatened that uh, they are prevented from. You know, Koko okay. Nikosa, yes, yes, yes. Uh, the former president, together with uh, Samiata Mills, mm. should not dare set mm. foot there when they are commemorating. Oh, yes, oh really? That's what he says. He says Interesting. They show up there, mm. and they are telling him that if they are barred from that, then they will just exhume the body and move him from there. And can any NGO, so to speak, mm. come and you know <laughs> uh, dictate to them what to do from? And there. the delegate has some beautiful cartoon on the page three. Get it and look at it. Police acted harshly in Islamic SHS saga. COVID nine COVID fund disperses fifty three million cities and Freddie Blay hands over to in team. The right. new regime begins. Blade to in team. He has passed on the baton. Yeah. Like so, Mujik. The final newspaper, 53 million Ghana cities out of 62 million raised by COVID-19 trust fund disbursed. Mm. We've been talking about that. Road safety authority calls for trauma centers along crash-prone highways. Uh, pictured there, I believe this is uh, engineer uh, David Adonting. There's also uh, civil service embraces digitalization. Uh, Ajaman Dramana says so. And 1,051 bought flights using Ghana card from various countries to Ghana. That's immigration uh, data. Picture there, the vice president smiling, beaming. Uh, let's see. I, I, just might, um, I just might travel one of these days. Uh, uh, I'll see. With the Ghana card. I'll, I'll try my Ghana <laughs> card and see how, how effi efficiently it works mm. in that regard. Mm. There's also, um, just to wrap, so well, we will the, crap, crap mm -hmm. the whip, the Daily Statesman, new MPP General Secretary warns recalcitrant executives, mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, JFK, okay. Justin Frimpong Kudia, and the Kaskudian, well, uh, Ashanti MPs to meet president over mm. projects. You know, uh, the recent bit. To do yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ro 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 Lee, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Now, uh, the Accra Times, uh, torturing illegal minors on acceptable minority to government. I saw, I'm, I'm sure you saw the, that, right. that, that video. It was was quite terrible. Publisher, Defense Minister Inspect Barracks Regeneration Project, Green Street Project in the Orphan, uh, in the Orphan Lands Minister, and uh, Sunyani Airport ready for operation, Transport Minister says.
All right. Yeah, let's go later. So, so that's right. where we mm. sew it up. Uh, mm -hmm. It's always good. It's always good having you. Always good to be here, you know. W will you be watching me when I deliver my blunt thoughts? I will. I will be watching you. Yeah, from, from my corner. Democracy, democracy, election, auction. Stay mm. with me for that. I'll be back with that right after sports. But up next, sports. Stay. Oh, there you are. Me gano be so ano pay. Don't call me, oh, don't call me. Don't call me, oh, don't call me. Don't call me. Me wa niyama nubi wa hai. Inti mumbe tobi. What am I selling, you ask? A whole lot, actually. I'm not in the market, but my jingling bell will make a lot more sense to you as I announce to you the title of my blunt thoughts for today. And here it is. Auctions or elections, moneycracy or democracy, the nasty twists and turns of Ghanaian politics. Ghana for money talks. Oh, yes, money talks. Did you see how smoothly the MPP's delegates conference went just about a week ago? It wasn't just about the organization. It was money talking, making things move like a well-oiled machine. And our country, and our economy likewise, can function like well-oiled machines. But because we keep electing leaders who are sellouts, they deceive us, get out of the helm, and steal all our money. Even with the calls for a reduction of ostentatiousness and opulence, look at what we saw and heard. Accusations of vote buying and more. The national cake indeed is big enough for all of us, grandfather and grandmother, parents and children, to benefit from. Yet because we're in a rigged system, only a few, those in power and those close to those in power, are eating almost all of it. The cake, you see, is big enough to satisfy everyone's need, but definitely not everyone's greed. Before becoming president, Nanado Donkwe Kufuado told us he would defend the public purse. Well, he's defended it all the way to the IMF, that's for sure. Our breed of politicians will share Spare no means to outmuscle with their foot soldiers and serial communi communicators, outbuy with money and other goodies, and tell barefaced lies just to get power. And we all know what happens after they get it now, don't we? In the past, we have seen bags of sachet water, rice and oil branded with the images of politicians, bundles of money with labeling for this or that contender, even in intra party elections of the two major political parties. We have seen scholarships being used as inducement. We have witnessed vehicles of different kinds, motorbikes and cars, being used to secure votes. Even flat screen TVs have been on the chopping board. All of that to purchase votes. All of that to purchase these votes like foodstuffs at a market. So yes, the sale is ongoing. Who will be selling his vote next? Just remember though, in that world where the politician buys your vote, they become political versions of Jesus, the Christ, who died for our sins and paid our debt in full on the cross. For the politician, though, once he pays you and you vote for him, if he wins, whatever debt he owes you in his, his or her mind has been paid to you in full, in advance. This is why now, in our two major political uh, parties, and let's, let's, let's get more details of that, in our two major political parties, people will virtually kill to become delegates, especially at the national level. Do you figure those on the Tescon, you know, those Tescon representatives who were recently denied the right to vote at the MPP's National Delegates Conference were aggrieved simply because they couldn't have a say in who occupied which position? Go figure. Our politicians, Ghana for, have hijacked our democracy. And like docile sheep, we keep mute as they lead us to the slaughter. We have become so blind owing to selfish personal interest, stupid ethnocentrism, and a refusal to use our brains in some respects, and the politicians have capitalized on that. You know me, I'm blunt. I don't care two hoots what anyone thinks. But let me tell you a secret. If we do not wake up, eh, someday people from China, the United States, the UK, and other places will come and tell us, hey, you know what? This land is no longer yours. This house is our property. This national monument is actually ours, like the Chinese are already doing with the Entebbe Airport in Uganda, where they are going to milk that facility for all it's worth for some 20 years. How harsh can you be? 
But can you blame them when the Ugandan political leaders let their economy slide and accepted such a deal? If we don't watch it, strangers will someday come to us and say, these gold mines and lithium, we've got lithium now, these oil fields, these swathes of land with timber, these water bodies, etc., are all ours. And we'd not be able to say or do anything about it because these misleaders we keep electing and supporting would have, like Esau in the Bible, sold our birthright for a pot of bean stew. That is just how callous they are and just how foolish we are for enabling them, sponsoring them, and giving them the leeway to destroy us. Yes, destroy us. My thinking is simple. Once we keep operating this servant master system, where the masses rather are the servants, we shall never beat corruption and never develop. Because the system we operate is too heavily skewed towards the interests of certain classes of people. Our leaders, and once they are reaping the harvest they haven't sown, do you honestly think they will willingly give that up? Never. They will tell us what we want to hear, but in their minds it is Yankonkwan. Consider our Article 71 office holders, for example. Do you think if they didn't have any or most of the perks they enjoy, thanks to our taxes, they would be sitting tight like they are now? The president says we have slashed executive salaries by 30%. What does that mean to someone earning 20,000, 30,000, and in some cases, over 60,000 Ghana CDs? Yet if you, as a public servant, they take even 20 CDs off your salary, it could be a life and death situation. What does it mean to us when fuel allocations are slashed uh, by some government officials? By, by what? Uh, 50%. When that 50% is merely a pittance to them because it is insignificant compared to the perks they get. Yet for you, that could be your entire month's salary, or maybe more. If we keep things this way, we shall complain from the cradle to the grave. Nothing, I repeat, nothing will change in Ghana. If the Article 71 officers were earning salaries like we are, and feeling the pinch of rent like we do, and experiencing the bite of fuel prices and skyrocketing food costs like we are, they would have fixed this broken system a long time ago. Trust me. But once they are comfortable, this is what we shall get. Lots of empty talk and loads of white elephant projects. In a country whose central bank uh, foreign reserves have dwindled steadily in just a few months, from $9 billion to $3 billion, especially when we're expending some, what, $600 million every month. It beats me how our politicians can live so ostentatiously and get away with it. You will see a British prime minister or a Dutch leader riding a bicycle to work. Sometimes. The Ghanaian politician who cannot even solve his country's no-bed syndrome or eradicate the sad phenomenon of having schools under trees and schools with dilapidated structures. The one who expects poor students to be fed on 97 pesos a day on the school feeding program, rides in luxurious V8 Land Cruisers and other posh vehicles. In the meantime, we have Kantanka. In Kaya Pampusikano or Yaya Automotive Industry Numwa. Senkeye, and you're bad. But we don't have that. I shared a thought recently about Uganda and its government, its government-sponsored manufacture of buses for us. For us here, lie, lie, let's keep importing $180,000 vehicles till thy kingdom come. Why would we not be broke with this kind of attitude? The people we go to to bet for money have modest leaders. Look at our leaders. We need veranda and so also benying adre. I hope and pray that the $750 million loan that has now been approved for Ghana will be used for all the roads and other projects we claim they will be expended on. If not, we are watching kingly and we will expose any rot in there. The Ghanaian politician, Ghana for, is unconscionably wicked. Isn't it so despicable and disgraceful? You're a Ghanaian politician, yet you live large like a sultan or sultana, while your people cannot even get what they will eat. People are cutting down meals for themselves and even their children just so they can survive. Yet you, the politician they elected to better their lives, are just interested in the next corrupt deal so you can get your kickback. You all ought to be ashamed of yourselves. But oh, wait, I forgot. Our Ghanaian politicians have no shame. They know not how to resign when they fail. And most definitely, do not want to be accountable. But we shall force probity and accountability down their throats, whether they like it or not. They will learn. Our Ghanaian politicians appear to forget when in power that they too will die someday and will have to give account of their stewardship to our Father in Heaven. But hey, some of us will not wait until then. We will force their hands now, else if we wait for God's justice, 
which is never late, by the way, and always right on target, these thieves would have destroyed our country completely. The time to act is now. I mean, why? The public purse has been ravaged time and again by politicians, and we have cover-up upon cover-up while Amagana bleeds to death. Until when shall we change this highly rigged system? Why should the monkey always work for some useless baboon to chop? See, I see it is Nasikano, Ewehe. The University of Ghana, our nation's premier academic institution at the tertiary level, has seen its population explode over the last decade. But they are seriously struggling with the issue of accommoda accommodating students. But how much help do our governments give them? Faustina, a young pregnant woman at 31, left us all heartbroken when she died in the hospital in Fijai because her husband did not have 600 Ghana cities to fuel an ambulance to convey her so she'd receive medical attention. She's gone, just like many hundreds and thousands of others who have endured this for the over 16 years it has been going on. I am not saying that. The head of the National Ambulance Service himself said it. We live in such lack in this country, yet our politicians, our leaders, even in opposition, all look rosy and well-kept. No cheekbones, no showing cheekbones, no collarbones that are showing to see, no signs of hunger or lack. Yet look at the ordinary man on the street. We're simply not angry enough. Corruption has made its home in our country. It has set up its throne in Ghana. No wonder the latest report from the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice teaming up with the Ghana Statistical Service and the United Nations, uh, you know, the UNODC is revealing so much. We are simply cowards. If Nkrumah had been a coward, we would never have gained our independence. Never. Maybe it's high time we started setting up anti-corruption clubs in our schools, institutions, and what have you, to get the citizenry more aware of the menace, the havoc corruption wreaks on our society and how not to fall into the same trap. This could bring a groundswell of not just crusaders against corruption, but shape future leaders who will know and do better. Our politics has now devolved into a garage or car boot sale. Our democracy has been sold to the highest bidder. And this is what it really means. I'm going to be looking at some slides. Let's take a look at those slides, and then I'll continue with my thinking. Now, if you look at the number of political parties we have had in Ghana, you can see that there is gradually incremental value between 1957 and 2022. Let's move on to the next slide. But here is a quote from Alban Sumana Bagbe. Since the inception, in fact, this is from the CDD, since the inception of the Fourth Republic on January 7, 1993, the role of money in Ghanaian politics has grown exponentially. In 2018, the Westminster Foundation for Democracy and the Ghana Center for Democratic Development reported an estimated 59% increment in the cost of running for office as a member of parliament from 2012 to 2016. Now, how much would it cost you for presidential elections to get elected? As of 2016, it stood at 575 million Ghana cities. How about parliamentary elections? It would cost you some 4 million Ghana cities as of 2016. 2 million to nurture your constituency and uh, for the primaries. Another 2 million to run your main elections. Now, we come to the quote from Alban Bagman. When you go talk to your party members and any of them approach you, they will tell you that you cannot just come and talk to me like that and go away. Oh. When you visit the chiefs, the courtesy must be followed. Your pocket is empty. When you are going around and you are not, you know, greasing palms, they will vote against you. When you do not organize events and, and let the drinks, food, and music flow, you are bound to lose. You don't have the money, and some people are sponsoring. You spend about 2 million Ghana cities to be elected as a member of parliament. Who pays the piper calls the tune. Look at that. Sources of campaign financing. There's an interesting bit in there. When you look at grassroots contributions, 12.5%. Funds from parties, elected officials, and electoral candidates, 20%. Unauthorized use of state resources for partisan campaign activities, a whopping 10%. Support from other party sympathizers, they claim 52.5%. Corporations, 2.5%. Foreign funding, governments and institutions, and that also can be dangerous, 2.5%. Total, 100%. Next slide. If you look at the recipients and contributions and support to political parties, 
it is at least as of 2016, national party representatives contributing 37.5%. That is what they get. Regional rep reps, 10%. Constituency, 27.5%. Presidential candidate, 12.5%. Other party members, 2.5%. And the rest in limbo, 10%. But when you look at the profiles of the kinds of people who frequently contribute to political parties and their electoral efforts, look at that. Current government official, 15% plus. Former government official, 17% plus. Political party official, 20% plus. Look at the parliamentarians and business people. Look at the others. Look at political parties in the diaspora. Our entire system is rigged. How can we even consolidate some of these figures? Next slide. I just want to do this comparative analysis as we end. Look at the United States in terms of GDP. Let's do a comparative analysis. $23 trillion. The UK, $3.19 trillion. Nigeria, $440.78 billion. South Africa, $419 billion. Kenya, $110 billion. Ghana, $77.59 billion. Look. Let me tell you a bit about the American and Nigerian examples. One Western one, one African one. Between them, Joe Biden and Donald Trump are together suspected to have spent about $11 billion on campaigning in 2020. But that is on the back of record spending because of the high stakes involved in election 2020. In fact, in 2008, Obama spent $730 million on his campaign. A lot of that came from legal fundraising activity. But here's where it gets pretty interesting. To be president in Ghana, bearing in mind our GDP gap compared to the United States, GDP and everything else, as of 2016, 575 million Ghana cities, the equivalent using yesterday's dollar exchange rate of $77.38 million. Stay with me. The startling truth is that this means while our GDP as a country is only about one three hundredth that of the United States, our spending on elections for the presidency is a startling one tenth of what averagely would be spent in the US. Imagine that. This means while the American economy is some 299 times bigger than ours in terms of GDP, we spend up to about one-tenth of what their leaders spend to get the knot into the White House. I mean, how? Where do our leaders get all that money from? Who sponsors them? We don't have officially approved fundraising standards here for elections. So how do they get all that money? Do you see why corruption in Ghana will not end if we maintain this highly rigged system? Nigerian law, until February this year, said the maximum amount to be spent by a presidential candidate should not exceed 1 billion naira, the equivalent of $2.4 million dollars although it has now increased to about 5 billion naira, which is about $12 million. We don't even have laws. This reveals one thing. Because of the avenues available to steal from public coffers, these con artists will do everything possible to get into these offices because whether they are handpicked, uh, like our DCs, MCs, board chairs, CEOs, and the rest, or whether they are constituency, regional, or national party officers of the two major political parties, or MPs, or presidential candidates, they all know how this game is played. Once in office, they can, like Shylock in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, get their pound of flesh, or to be more blunt, many kilograms of it. Our politics has, in fact, become so expensive that it will cost you an arm and a leg just simply to get defeated. To win the ultimate is another matter altogether. But I ask you, Ghana for. Is this what we want our, poli our politics and politicians to be like? Is this what we wanted when in that referendum in 1992 we opted for this fourth Republican democratic adventure? We have a thousand and one corruption related cases to point to, yet no one is getting convicted even when they are caught red handed with their hands in the cookie jar because our politics thrives on monetary influence. Almost all would be contenders arm themselves by raping the public purse through corrupt deals Cutting corners at every end. From kickbacks on contracts, which mean those contracts are not going to be properly executed anyway, to contract inflation, to concessions for mining licenses, it is all in someone's personal interest. That also 
is why when you have an executive the size of an elephant, like we do, you will likely have corruption at a commensurable size. Finito. While I cannot say, uh, while referring to ministers of state and maybe members of parliament, and throwing some MMDC CEOs and even chairmen of boards here and there, that all of them are corrupt, because not all of them will be, and not all of them will line their pockets with state resources. We know most of them double in at least some form of corruption in myriad ways. Why? Because of the orientation of our politics. Because our scheme of politics incentivizes same. That was clearly shown by the latest Shraj Ghana Statistical Service UNODC report. Did you note in there how corrupt our public officials are? But it doesn't end there. Because our politicians do it, those are the grassroots of their political parties. I've also taken up their sinister, you know, sinister behavior. So party members feel it is their political birthright to stash, reroute, and cash in for uh, premix fuel, sell their votes to the highest bidder in elections, and so on. Fellow Ghanaians, slowly, but very steadily, our elections have become auctions, and our democracy has transmogrified into a money crusty. The mantra, no money, no vote. But come to think of it, why should one pay to serve people? What's the incentive? In our brand of politics, well, quite a lot, actually. We know what they get. Most of our politicians come to steal and destroy, so they know what's in it for them. But to you, I ask, what is your vote worth? Can your conscience be bought? Mind you, if you sell your vote to a politician, a sale is a sale. If they pay you, no further you know, mind during their tenure. Consider yourself paid in full. Fair is fair. But if we truly want our, to hold our leaders, especially the political ones, to account, then we must learn to set aside our momentary gain for even greater benefits for booms. We cannot eat our cake and have it. So as I end, I want to force home this message. Young people of Ghana, to you especially, I bid you to wake up, arise, arise and hold our leaders' feet to the fire of accountability, else you will have no future. Because guess what? Your future, your birthright, is being sold at <laughs> don't call me prices today. Right now. See a uti bone, na wan kasa, and ye wala o wala. My name is Benjamin Akako. I am very passionate about Ghana and Africa as a whole. These are my blunt thoughts for you this Friday morning, served hot, raw, and diluted. God bless Ghana. All right, here we are. Uh, thank you for staying. We get into the big stories and a new opinion poll conducted by the Global Info Analytics in July 2022 shows that John Mahama of the opposition NDC is in a significant lead of 58% compared to the 31% in a hypothetical race with vice presidential candidate or vice president of, of our country, Dr. Mahamadou Baumia. Again, it shows that 76% of the populace think the country is headed in the wrong direction. What are the underpinning factors? And is this a true reflection of the situation on the ground? We'll inter interrogate these matters thoroughly and also get some highlights from the Afrobarometer report, uh, bringing you details as well as far as that latest uh, Ghana Statistical Service, Shraj, and UNODC report uh, talks about. Corruption. Now, joining us for the discussion, Dr. Osai Kwapong. He's a CDD fellow. We also have Dr. Kabiru Mahama. He is with the office of the vice president and uh, Musa Dankwa, executive director, Global Info Analytics. Gentlemen, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining the conversation. Thank you. Okay, so I'd love to hear from those on Zoom, just to clarify uh, the sound bits. I, I'd like to hear from both of you. Yes, good morning. Okay, C can I? Good morning. Okay, that's good. Thank you, gentlemen. Let me also come into the studio. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahama, for joining the conversation. 
particular. Okay, so I look forward to a very uh, insightful conversation. I'll start with you, um, uh, Musa Dankwa, especially as you came through with this latest research uh, piece as Executive Director of Global Info Analytics. The last time you came out with such a piece, there was some criticism from uh, the majority side or the ruling government concerning your methods and all of that. Uh, is it the same methods uh, you used to come out with? Yes. Uh, this 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 research has anything changed? Oh yeah, significantly. Um, as we said the last time, that the way we went about our last poll was purposeful. It was designed to give us something. It wasn't because we didn't know what to do. This time around, we ran the uh, poll on entirely random simulated uh, system that picked the constituencies automatically without human interference. And it was deployed also randomly and people were interviewed on the street randomly. So we kind of addressed the issues uh, my colleagues uh, raised uh, at the time. So we have resolved all those problems. Mm. Now tell us a bit about, I mean, the meat of the matter has to do with those two points. 76% uh, of the populace thinking the country is headed in the wrong direction. This feeds into the latest uh, Afrobarometer uh, statistics that we've seen where upwards of 80% of the people, in fact, the lowest we've seen in over a decade or so, just about 11% saying the country is headed in the right direction. But let's focus on your report. 76% of the population thinks the country is headed in the wrong uh, direction. Uh, tell us how you went about this research. So your, your margin of error, how many people you you actually interacted with uh, across which regions? I noticed you went to practically all the regions. Tell us a bit about uh, how you conducted this survey. Right, uh, thank you very much. First and foremost, all we did was that we told the system to select 27% of the 275 uh, areas that we have in the country. So the system randomly picked 27% of the 275 percent processes we have in the country, and that gave us the 75 that we had. Now that 75 then informed us as to what sample size we should take, because we have to look at the population of the areas we are sampling, and then to determine which sample size would give us a margin of error of 1.73 percent. Um, so our sample size, which was 5,490, was then allocated to each constituency based on the weight in terms of registered voters in that area, which is based on the EC register of 2020. And the people were interviewed on the street uh, in at least three electoral areas of those constituencies randomly without any pre-selection criteria. Okay, so that is how you came by uh, these uh, statistics. And you feel it is aptly representative of the entirety of the country? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We have no doubt about that. Let's do a breakdown of uh, the portion that talks about 76% of the population thinking the country is headed in the wrong direction. There's a bit of a breakdown in terms of those uh, who think it is, you know, headed completely very bad in, in terms of being in the wrong direction and those who are midway through. Give us a breakdown of the statistics. Right. Um, the survey showed that only 16% of voters believe the country is headed in the right direction, compared to 76%. If you look at our previous poll in April, the number who said we were in the right direction was 26. Now, a drop of 10% within 90 days. And for those who said we were heading the wrong direction, it has gone up from 67 to 76. And those with that opinion currently stands at 8%, which was about 7% last time. So we have seen a deterioration in, 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 in the polling numbers for those who think the country is heading in the right direction. Mm. Now, what we did was to, to go beyond this general headline to look at really how the party affiliate affiliation really uh, thinking in terms of MPP voters, NPC voters, and floating voters. But that will give you a better sense of what is happening. Right. Now, on that score, 63% of MPP sympathizers mm -hmm. believe the country is headed in the wrong direction. 
Which is stark, isn't and it? And 80% 80 of it's very stark. Mm. Very, very stark mm. from your own base. Mm. And 88% of NDC people believe the country is headed in the wrong direction. But a good measure of this is to look at the floating voters. 82% of them said the country is headed in the wrong direction. Mm. This must be a worrying. I, I, I missed that. Which what you say is what? Very worrying. Uh, Yes, because uh, as a government, they give you a better measure of really what is happening because they're not aligned to either of the opposition mm. or your own base. They give you a fair assessment of what they feel is going on. Mm. And that number is 82% of floating mm. voters. Mm. I'm looking at uh, the different dynamics, the president's approval and all of that. But even if you look at the, the direction of the country, like we've pointed to, wrong direction. Uh, so in April... Uh, those who had no opinion were 7%. Uh, those who said right direction were 26%. Uh, those who said wrong direction were 67%. In April, uh, but now, in July, that is, you look at those who say who have no opinion, it's shot up by a percentage point, 8%. And then when it comes to those who say we're headed in the right direction, it's taken a 10 percentage point fall to 16%. Uh, percent and then wrong direction has taken a 10 percent increment to 76 uh, percent uh, the gender statistics are also in there but then we have uh, the direction of the country into age groups and then political affiliation like you were mentioning so right direction 28 percent of uh, those are in the mpp for the the ndc only six percent uh, which is interesting, CPP 8%, and it goes on. But for those who say it's headed in the wrong direction, like you mentioned, 63% of supporters of the MPP that you sampled said it was headed in the wrong direction. For the NDC, 88%. And, and this is where it gets interesting. For the rest of the parties, for this figure, CPP 82%, wrong direction. PNC 72%, wrong direction. Uh, PPP 74%, wrong direction. Others 82%. In other words... It's, it, you would have an average of about, what, 77%, all of them saying the country is headed in the wrong direction. Then you come to the president's approval ratings. You would realize, again, and I'll end here as I wrap with you for this portion of the conversation. Uh, you would realize that for those in April who had no opinion, it stood at 6%. In July, it still stands at 6%. For those in April who said they approved of the president's uh, handling of the country, it stood at 27% in April. It has taken a four percentage point decline in July, falling to 23%. And then of those who disapprove, it was 67% in April. Now it is 72%. What does this reveal to you? It reveals really what the direction of the country has concerned. Mm. Generally, when people are not happy with the way the country is going, they tend to blame the driver. And looking at what is happening in the economy across educational sector and everywhere, things are really dire. And that is reflected in the polling numbers that we have. Mm. And I mean, for the person to sink this low at this point, and I think somewhere, it, we must get to the bottom. Otherwise, this is going to really be very bad, I mean, for the government. Because it's not a good number to be at. And the polling numbers are trending in the very wrong direction at the moment. Well, at least for the presidency, I know of other countries, major countries, whose leaders have maybe something close to 20 plus percent. So it wouldn't be terrible, but it's not a good place to be. I mean, on any scale, 23 percent is not a pass mark, not in any exam. But let me come to Dr. Osai Kwapong on this self-same uh, matter. Doc, so considering this latest global info analytics survey and, and what it evinces, what it shows, what do you make of it? Is it a fair reflection of what you see? Thank you. Um, yeah, if you, I mean, if you follow public sentiment on, uh, on all matters, economics, the economy, uh, the comments you hear from uh, individuals, some of the agitations we've seen from organized labor. 
you can see why in such a whole discontent would be captured and reflected, right? Um, we've seen occasions where one or two groups have demonstrated, they've pointed to things like uh, fuel prices, uh, the e-levy debate generated some discontent as well. So if you look at you know food prices, transportation fares, all of those things. So if you look at some of the, uh, the issues that have dominated public discourse, public conversations, you can actually see why those sentiments would be reflected in, uh, in the poll that uh, Global Info Analytics uh, conducted. Um, and especially too, because of the use of randomization in the methodology, there you do know that you are getting as close to a representative sample as possible. Yes, they do indicate their margin of error because uh, any social science researcher will tell you that any data you collect will have a certain amount of noise you know, in it. But the other thing that you also have to look at is if you also look at what the Afrobarometer round nine captured, right. Right. then you can see that there is also validation to what global exactly. info analytics it, Because there, it is even over 80%. Precisely. So if you look at direction of the country, if you look at rating of government economic performance, if you look at government delivery of public, uh, public services, you can actually see um, that the sentiments being expressed are quite similar um, in terms of what they captured and what Afrobarometer is capturing. And again, I think overall, when I look at some of these surveys um, and polls, I always say that as a consumer of them, you have, to, you have to ask yourself, what sort of signals is it sending about what people are feeling based on their lived experiences, right? If I approach you and I ask you, well, is the country going in the right or the wrong direction? chances are you are going to recall certain personal experiences. And those lived experiences, I believe, is what informs the way respondents actually do uh, respond to, to, to these questions. If, if, the, if what Afrobarometer had found and what Global Info Analytics had found were at variance, total opposites, then you can start getting so, worried say, about... Say, say if, if the Afrobarometer had said... 80 plus percent, but Global Info Analytics had said 20 something percent. Then you would see that. Right. Like or one like, said right direction, the right. other said wrong direction. Then you, you can start raising questions about the soundness of the methodology being used. But I think once you see some convergence around common themes, then you can be rest assured that the methodology is as good as it can get recognizing that, again, no methodology is 100% soundproof. Let me ask you this. These are dire economic times, and we're headed to the IMF. Uh, but we are not the only country. Look at what has happened in Sri Lanka. So there are worse, you know, look at some countries in South America and all of that, going through quite some turmoil. But then people would quickly re remind you of what we are sitting on. And, of course, we've been told, Yatisikaso. Mm -hmm. So... The question is, looking at the president's approval, for example, Nanado Dankwe Kufuado is not returning to the presidency. So, I mean, for him, uh, maybe there may not be much to lose on a personal level, while the party has a whole lot to it stands to lose. When you look at the president's approval by region, you would notice that in the greater Accra region, the approval rating is only 13%, which is crucial. Because we know that in our politics, win the Greater Accra region and your likelihood of winning the election is really high, apart from the Ashanti region. It's 13% in the Greater Accra region. In the Ashanti region, the World Bank of the NPP, it stands at 33%. That is just about 33, you know, I mean, it, it, it's stark when I, when I looked at it. Eastern region. Another region that has given a lot of votes to the MPP, it stands at 22%. The disapproval in the eastern region is 70%. The disapproval in the Ashanti region is 60%. In the greater Accra region, it is 82%. In fact, in the Volta region, but that's to be expected, the disapproval rating is 95%. But 
I want us to focus on these three, Greater Accra, Ashanti, Eastern. These seem to be sort of the kingmakers, in a way, when it comes to presidential uh, elections. And as it looks right now, things are not shaping up according to plan. Just to add, when you look at the optimism with Nanako Fuadu as president, 44% are, in fact, 23% are optimistic. 32% are pessimistic, and those who are not sure are 44%. Either ways, it's not looking good. Your, your quick reflection on that before I come into the studio and engage Dr. Mahama. Right. So for me, what it signals and points to is the difficult political terrain that the incumbent faces. Now, 2024 is two years away. We always say that in politics, one day is even a very long time, mm. right? But there's no denying that the signals you're seeing coming from Afrobarometer Round 9, the Global Info Analytics poll, is that the incumbent is facing a very difficult political terrain as it goes into election 2024. If you compare that to the 2016 uh, political terrain, you would notice that if you look at a number of the polls that I followed, some of the ones that I really liked, um, you would notice that the incumbent faced um, a very difficult political terrain as well. 2020, it wasn't so difficult um, for the incumbent. Um, but this time around, you're seeing that the terrain is very difficult. The question, uh, and, and as you rightly pointed out, uh, the president is on his way out. Um, he, he's not running for re-election. I would think that on, uh, for the purposes of legacy, you would always want to leave office on a high. Right. But I think the other bigger challenge then is who pays the price for these numbers that we're seeing? Mm. Is this party going to be made to pay the price um, for it by you know, debate at the polls? Um, and again, these early signals seems to show that the party may pay a price for it. But at the same time, between now and 2024, will things change? Will optimism get better? Will people feel better about the direction of the country? I think... What, 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 what do you think? What, what do you think on that specific... I mean, now we have $750 million to play with, uh, which we are going to use for a number of projects. We're expecting money from the IMF, and we've been told that they are going to fast track this. So initially, we've been told first quarter of 2023, we may get it earlier than that. Do you feel there is the capacity to turn things around so that uh, the down, the, the spiral in the numbers could change? The capacity to turn things around, yes, right? Uh, especially with uh, the support that we're going to be getting from the IMF. I believe that by two years, you would see uh, some um, positive turn around. Now, I don't know how significant that is going to be. And I also don't know how significant that would that is also going to be in terms of changing the perceptions and the feelings, you know, of the voter, right? So if things begin to turn around, are they going to then say, you know what, we can forgive you for the three, four years of difficulties that we face? Or are they going to still say that because of what you took us through, even though we are beginning to see light at, light at the end of the tunnel, we still believe that there's a political price to pay. And that is a decision that the voters are going to make. But I believe that some of these um, stopgap measures, and, and especially the IMF bailout, um, would definitely bring some stability to the economy as to whether it would be strong enough and significant enough to alter the feelings, the attitudes and perceptions of the voters. I think with that, only, uh, only, only, time, only time will tell. Let me come into the studio now and interact with, and thank you for your patience, Dr. Mahama. Uh, I just had to get, you know, this uh, background to the conversation from our two other guests, especially as they are on Zoom, so I can have ample time with you as uh, well. Uh, how does, you are in the office of the vice president. Yes, please. How does the presidency, uh, the vice president, how do they feel about this latest report? Yeah, thank you very much, Ben. And then uh, let me say good morning to Dr. and my brother, Musa Dankwa. Uh, you recall when the first survey came in, yeah. in April, 
and we had discussion on this. I, I, I was one of the lead critics of this particular uh, survey because there were some. I think you together with, is it Dr. Yes, Mensah? Dr. Mensah. Right. And then we were very clear in our mind that when you want to do a survey of this particular nature, you will need to be very clear in your methodology. You need a methodology that can stand the test of time. And you need to, to, to have, I mean, a research process that is devoid of petty errors and devoid of uh, common uh, mistakes when it comes to the ethics of the profession. Right. So uh, I think uh, people thought we were, because it has something to do with the MPP presidential primaries and government rating, we were taking it personal, but that wasn't the case. And I must commend him for addressing most of the, most of the concerns we raised and most of the methodological deficiencies or defects of the previous uh, survey. That said, I would also want us to start from the July, uh, uh, what do you call, from the July pools, because that serves as the foundation with which we can have further you discussion. From the April pools? From the April pools, we cannot rely on the April pool because you cannot- You cannot rely you can, on Yeah, you cannot- Can you rely on the July pools? You can rely on the July pools. You, you, you feel the- I feel like, I feel the, like- The, the methodology The is methodology better. is sound, okay. the processes is clear, okay. and that we can rely on the, on the, on the July pools. So, I want us to. So, so is that to say that uh, as of what was done in July, you you ex if you accept the methodology, then you also by extension. By extension, I accept the results. Yeah, the, by extension, I'll say, and I'll come to explain. So I, I just want us to avoid the, pro, the 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 tendency or the temptation to be comparing April to July because you are comparing apples and oranges, which is going to be problematic. Also, it's the same Ghana. It's, 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 it may not be the same sample size and not the exact same people, yeah. but. There's, there's relativity in there. there is, no matter the relativity, there's, there's, there's it, some, it, you know... It could equally be argued that they are all fruits, but apple is different from orange. What, what, why is April, let's say, an orange and July an apple? What, what makes because it one, in, in April, the, the process was, it, said it was purpose. It was done to achieve a certain purpose. In other words, they used a non-random I mean, random, non -random sample technique. Mm. Now you are comparing a non-random sample technique with a random sample technique. The two don't match. And for instance, if you had gone specifically to a particular constituency to select, there's likelihood that you are selecting from an NDC stronghold because it's purposive. Mm -hmm. But with randomness, you are giving each and every subject an equal opportunity of being represented in your sample. Which is what happened. Which is happening in this particular right. case. So that's why I'm saying that we should start from the, the, the July, uh, what you call survey, and then continue from there. The presidency and the vice president and the president of the republic is very clear that if the government is supposed to be rated, at this particular time, government will have disapproval rating. Assessment of the people, of the Ghanaian public, on the performance of government is going to be bad because what they feel now is what is going to feature into the survey or the responses they give into the, to the survey. Mm -hmm. So with that particular understanding, government is not surprised that we have this kind of results and it's not surprised that the Afrobarometer survey is giving consistent result with the info analytic uh, survey. The only thing but, that... But, 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 but hold it there for me. I, I get the point, and I, and I agree with you to a large extent. But an approval rating of 33% in the Ashanti region, 13% in the Great Accra region, 22% in the Eastern region, where you've got some of the biggest margins. How much of a concern is that to the presidency? I mean, as a government, it is very, it is very worrying that the people would have to rate or approve a president or i mean a president they rely so much on the hopes of the ghana people was on the president so the, the president he would be worried about this particular resource however the president understands or the government understands clearly what is the reason why the people are rating the president that down the downward approval or the disapproval of the of the of the president is largely because look we are facing an economic crisis mm -hmm. this economic crisis, government has no business trying to I mean, uh, deny responsibility for this. Government has the business well, of government explaining. Hasn't, has, hasn't the, government has taken responsibility. Government has taken the last time I heard from the vice president in whose office you operate, he, he practically did not accept responsibility for this. You know why? why? Because he cited a number of reasons. And he said COVID-19 and the Russo-Ukrainian war. Ghana did not produce COVID-19. Ghana did not bring about the Russo-Ukrainian war. Then he goes on to talk about the banking sector cleanup. He's talking, so, so what we expended yeah. in there. He's talking about the power arrangements yeah. and the spending. He is basically saying, 
Part of the problem was caused by external factors, the rest of the world. The internal problem was caused by Mahama and the NDC. Your government, this government, has not accepted responsibility. Ben, government has taken absolute responsibility for the economic crisis we are facing. But ah. government has also the responsibility of explaining to the people what is the nature of the problem and the cause of the problem. You cannot just tell the president that, look, Ghanaian people are not interested in knowing how we've gotten to this particular state. The president has taken responsibility by the fact that they have taken a decision to go to the IMF for a financial bailout. Government is taking fiscal consolidation measures. Government is taking expenditure rationalization measures. That's, these are the responsibility because if you don't take responsibility for a problem, you will not make attempt to solve it. So what I say government has taken absolute and complete responsibility for the problem. I'm basically telling you that government understand that it is elected to correct or to solve problems. And once the mandate of the people has been given to the government to solve problems, you have no business telling another person to come and solve the problem. That's why we've not asked, or government has not asked John Pre President John Mahman to come back and fix his problem. We are focusing on other problems. Mm. Basically, government is saying that, look, these problems were caused by A, B, C, D. Mm. And that A is as a result of... In, in any case, we can't have the former president come and solve the problems. Exactly. He's not president. Exactly. So the responsibility, the onus lies on the president or this current government to solve them. So that's what but I'm saying you, government don't, don't has taken agree? responsibility. A lot of people, I, I don't know, I'm sure you go on social media and you see the comments. A lot of people uh, seem to dislike the chant of, oh, former administration, former president. We're six years into uh, this administration. There are practically two years left till election 2024. That mantra, isn't it high time we dropped it? I think that with, in, with all... I mean, we don't hear Joe Biden, for example, or many other leaders across the world uh, continuously saying, oh, oh, Donald Trump, oh, Donald Trump. You don't hear that. No, the, the rhetoric of that is there in the politics. Even in the America, you hear Donald Trump. I'm saying it's not, the... that, it's not that... Very rarely would you hear that. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying that, look, if we have to detach ourselves from the politics, Ghanaians are interested in the solution. They are not interested in who caused the mess. Mm. or who created the problem. The Ghanaian people are interested in the politics. But the MPP and the ruling government, for that matter, if the NDC operatives or the, the structure of the NDC is trying to blame the government, then the, the MPP has the responsibility of explaining to them that, no, you know what, tell us what we have done specifically to create this mess. But in our opinion, a, B, C, D was what you did, and that has created this particular problem. So that, that explanation, game. So that explanation, you. No, that that explanation is, is for that the NDC, doing? for the Ghanaian people, for the journalists, for the media people, oh, for so the, the social... Vice president, when he was at the Accra Business uh, School, uh, that explanation was for NDC. That, uh, that, uh, that, NDC that, that is not... We are saying the blame game. The vice president never... The vice president was even hesitant in trying to tell them, look, this was NDC government. He only took his time to explain what the cause of the problem was or the causes of the problems were. So basically, the vice president is not blaming the NDC and tal, but the vice president is trying to explain how we came to find ourselves in this particular position. Ben, that said, I think that the survey and then the rating of the government is something that is worrying, but there is also a, another part. Is it in consonance with what you, because I know you are also conducting your surveys, you together with Dr. Mensah, and is it in consonance? Because, you know, after the last survey, yeah. Dr. Mensah came and totally poo-pooed, debunked yeah. what uh, that survey had said, and said that the approval ratings were high and all of that, and that, in fact, I think, uh, and I'm, I'm saying this cautiously, I could be wrong, if memory serves, that even then, you would, if, if elections were held then, you would win. Is that the same picture you have now? No, so let's, let's look at another part of that same survey, the, 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 the performance of the government. If you look at their survey on government performance, it's still quite an optimistic future. Or okay, optimism. So, so is it, this, this, I mean, this specific, same, this, this specific. Okay, this so specific, I'm looking at that because this that's specific, on page yeah, 25. 25. The government it, it, performance. It, it, it makes mention, and we can go to page 25 of the latest Global Info Analytics survey. Uh, it talks about April's uh, polling when it comes to excellence standing at 5%. Now it stands at 3% per this survey. Uh, when you come to very good or good, in April, it stood at 24%. It's lost 9 percentage points. It's now at 15%. When you look at those who feel it is an average performance, it stood at 23% in April. It is 21% now, 2 uh, percentage point decline. Very poor or poor, 
It was 48% in April. It's jumped 11 uh, points to 59% and no opinion, 3%. Your reaction? Yeah, so if you look at this particular uh, survey, basically it is telling you that, look, 41% of the Ghanaian people still have faith that government has done well or has done better. Mm. That, that is simply what it is telling you, that people who thought that on the average government has done better or has done well or has done excellent are there about 41%. If you compare that with people who say that they don't have opinion, majority of the respondents say that, look, when you look at the future of this particular country, what do you think, uh, what do you call it, things will, whether things will turn out better? This same pool is telling us that, look, we don't have an opinion now. They are holding brief for the government. Whilst another 25% say, look, things will get better. And another 32% say, no, things will not get better in the next few months or in the next few weeks. So basically, we are having to deal with 44% and 23%. And if this particular group and the concerns of these particular people are addressed, I'm sure that this government will be in a very good position to even seek the mandate of the Ghanaian people again. So basically, I take this particular resource very seriously. So the government take this resource seriously. So the government will be looking at addressing. The fundamental issue is that government is facing an economic crisis. It is not just the government of Ghana. It is across the globe and that half of the world is actually going for financial bailout. This is a context within which we have the responsibility to explain to the guy. I believe that the Ghanaian people are listening, I mean, descending people, they would listen to the reason. If they make sense to them, they would agree with the reason. If they don't make sense, they will reject the reasons. The bottom line is that the people are feeling economic hardship. The people are feeling, until recently, and I'm happy that fuel prices are coming down, I mean, they were feeling, I mean, hikes in petroleum the price prices. price of diesel is still a big problem. Yeah. I admit, they are yes. coming down, and it's a good thing. But yes. I mentioned diesel example because, you know, farm equipment, a lot of our trotters... It's, it's, it's an industrial it, fuel. It's, it's, it's a serious problem. Yeah, but I mean... And that is something that petroleum, I mean, government can tackle because when it affects them, guess what? They transfer it to us. I agree, I agree. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, diesel is an industrial fuel, so much of the productivity and yeah. economic growth will be dependent on how much the price of diesel comes down. So, but I'm just saying that, Looking at the development in the, I mean, the geopolitical development, the, the, the external forces, because we all agree, and there's no doubt in the mind of government and any objective listener that like 99%, in fact, sorry, 70% of the problem is external. There's no doubt in the mind of any objective economist or any objective, I mean, a bystander. Talking to economists like yeah. Professor Bokpin and yeah. the rest, trust me, they don't agree with you. In fact, I was at an IMF program just what? Two days ago, yeah. and Prof. Bokpin, you know, points what points to what other economists in this country have pointed to. Our problem started long before even COVID. In 2019, we were already beginning to bleed. And I can go to some of my research and point out to you that we we're already not doing the right things when it comes to handling our economy, even before uh, COVID struck. So I don't know about the 70 percent. Yeah, I'm I'm very huge. Sir, tells that in 2019 we were bleeding. The person should provide you with the statistics to show mm. that we are having problems. There is no single indicator, economic indicator, that was on a negative note or that was on a downward spiral prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. There was no single one. So that's what I've always been saying, that people would now begin to attribute several factors. If you're having a problem, people can even go back to uh, the, the time of uh, Adams to try to resurrect problems that were causing the current situation. But that, it may... I let, let, let me bring you some statistics, yeah. and I'll start from the COVID era. In 2020, when countries across the world were suffering the brunt of COVID-19, our neighbors like the Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso, Nigeria, all of them had deficits below 6%. Okay, what was our deficit? 15.7%. As far back as 2019, our public debt had surged about, by about 105 billion Ghana cities to 225 billion Ghana cities, compared to the figure of 120 billion when the MPP took over the reins of government in 2016. The writing was on the wall. Yeah. We refused so, to see it. Look, this, our, our currency has lost 24% of its value it's, it's, since January 2022. Inflation has risen to 29.8%. This is just last June. It has exceeded the central bank's target band of 6 to 10% for 10 months running. You, you look at, and in fact, something that is interesting, year-on-year -year inflation, the rate, 29.8%. Guess what? 
It is the exact same rate we had in 2003 when we went HIPIC. Yeah. So how, how can you be happy about yeah, it? Yeah, we are not happy. I'm not saying government is happy. And you are basically re-echoing the current sentiment and the current program. The contention was that prior to in 2019, we are facing problem. But this particular analysis is 2020 20 onwards. So yeah, we are so not... We are 2020 not, and then yeah, 2019. Yeah, 20, 20, 20, no, 20, there's no single 2019 No, there's data. 2019. Yeah, until let, you let, go there. You let, started with let, the physical no, no, deficit, let, which let was in 2020. Let me, let yeah, me maybe you come you. to that. You come to that. Maybe you no, do that. No, but let, in this particular data... Let me get to it for you. So in 2019, what I said, our public debt, we had accumulated... 105 billion Ghana cities, in addition to what we already yeah, but we that, had, we had added, no, but that, that, but that, that, but that is not. But look, what was the debt to when, GDP when, ratio? When you are when you are adding debt upon debt, heaping debt upon debt like that, uh, do you do you speak to look, economists? Countries, do you countries, to what they say countries, economists? countries have had more debt I mean, position than that in terms of volume. Mm -hmm. But we are losing. Our, what is this? What are the debt is social debt? No, no, let's no, 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 Ben, no. Ben, let's take Dr. let's Dr. Take, Ben, Ben, let's stick to the issue. Look. Look, we all admit that 2020, the economy has been in distress. Mm. That is a fact. I'm saying no that from 2019. Is. And I'm saying that from 2019, what was the debt to GDP ratio if mm. it was in distress? So that's what I'm saying. That's the contest. You don't just go and pick a debt figure, which is 105 billion, mm. added to the debt stock and say there was a problem. Look at how much the economy expanded within that particular period. Mm. And you look at the debt to GDP ratio. And then if it was beyond 70%, then you can just quickly say that, look, we are already distressed in 2019. That's the point I'm trying to make. But so the so government must we, position... Must we hit 70% before... No, no, I'm not saying we must hit 70%, but I'm saying that if you are debt situation, all, almost every country, Japan, United States, Britain, they See, all borrow. That, that is my problem. They all borrow. That is my problem when we go here, because any crack economist will tell you that some countries have over 300% debt to GDP ratio. Yes. But a lot of these countries, let's pick Japan. Japan has a lot of, what, 70, 80, 90% yes, of yes, its debt. Yes. Homegrown, it yes. is from internal sources. Its external shocks are like this. But the Infinitesimal. The, the guy you is, have a lot of external shocks that are, true. that are beyond you. It's not true that. And, and mind you, what do they borrow for in, to do in these countries? They borrow for projects that are self-sustaining, internally fund internally generating. What do we do? Ben. We borrow for chop chop. Ben. The point is that this government, even in the, in the context of our domestic debt, is still the majority of our debt position until what you call the depreciation of the city that is making our foreign debt to come even at par with our, our domestic debt. So that is, still, that is still similar. But I'm not trying to justify this particular point. I'm trying to just provide explanation to say that, look, let us not create a perception that, look, things have been, the economy has been managed into the abyss. Mm. That per perception should be corrected. Government has a responsibility of solving these particular problems. We shouldn't shy away from that. Government has a responsibility of, again, explaining these particular problems. Okay. But what I'm just basically saying is that, look, government is committed to solving this particular problem. The economy is in crisis. It's not just Ghana, again, you know, we talk of our neighbors. But people talk of Cote d'Ivoire. Cote d'Ivoire didn't have the problems that we have. Cote d'Ivoire mm. never faced power crisis. Mm. They never faced financial sector collapse. This, in addition to their COVID expenditure and our COVID expenditure, essentially, our, ours will be more which, than which, which power crisis are you referring to? We had Doomsaw, which we have to pay, we have to sign IPPs. That's why we're saying. But, but Doomsaw was solved before your tenure. But why do we keep on mentioning Doomsaw? We mention it because, we mention it because the payment, the IPP arrangement, the excess power. We're talking of the we are talking about yeah, excess situation. That's what excess power that we are using, but we always come back and say excess power. Plus, when you have excess power, we are you not. Do, look, if you want, Ben, you, go to you, the you minister are, of energy. You are well versed in yeah. economics. Yeah. You know about utility. Right? I know about utility. You, you know about how yeah. to maximize utility. Ex yes. so, so, so what? Why exactly do we keep harping that point? Look, there is there's the way you get to a point we get this utility. This utility. This, this utility was created because we had. Look, if you continue to drink water. The utility you gain from the first crop reduces. reduces. Mm. So if you have, if you have what you call an I mean, a power situation, a power crisis, and you want to fix it, you don't go taking a, a full gallon of water to drink. Okay, that's let's, basically let's, what, what, let's, what happened. Let's, let's hold it there. So basically, according to Dr. Mahama, seventy percent of the problems we are facing are external, right? Yes, please. All right, just to quote you there. Let me come to uh, Musa Dankwa uh, uh, as well, Executive Director, Global Info Analytics. I want us to look at corruption uh, because of, of, I mean, all, all this conversation we're having. I want us to feed it into the conversation. And I'm going to pick different things. Now, 
The latest Afrobarometer report, I'll start from somewhere, part of what you've done before I get to corruption, before I narrow it down. 87% of respondents in the latest Afrobarometer report say Ghana is heading in the wrong direction. Almost 9 out of 10, that is the 87%, say the country is headed in the wrong direction. Only 11% see things going in the right direction. That is a 24 percentage point decline since 2019. So 2019 till now, 29% uh, have uh, eroded when it comes to those who think Ghana is headed in the right direction. Interestingly, 85% describe the country's economic condition as fairly bad or very bad, which is up from the 62% recorded in 2019. And 72% say their living conditions are fairly bad or very bad compared to 58% three years ago. Let me also get to this statistic. As we have it now, when it comes to bribery, 27.6% uh, of adult Ghanaians say they have paid a bribe to a public official. And persons aged between 25 to 34 are more likely uh, to give a bribe with the most educated being the most likely to be corrupt. Let's come back to the Global Info uh, Survey. When you look at page 29, page 29, state of corruption in Ghana, you show there that those who have no opinion, in April it was 9%, now it stands at 5%. Those who think corruption is improving in terms of dealing with it, April, 14%. Now, 12%. They've lost two percentage points. Those who think it's, it's, it's the same, it's at par. 23% in April, 21% now. But guess what? Those who think it is getting worse, 54% then, 62% now. Um, how does all of this reflect, putting side by side your an analysis, side by side with what the Shraj GSS UNODC document tells us. Hello, do we have Musa Dankwa? Uh, please unmute, Musa. Please unmute for me. Okay, okay. Can you hear me now? I can hear you loud and clear. Go ahead. I think our poll validates what others have found. And it is consistently showing that people believe corruption in this country is getting worse. And um, you can see that the trend, and I, I, I'm really worried that this trend continue this way is going to be very bad. We need to get to a point where people have, can start having confidence in the system in terms of fighting corruption. At the moment, it doesn't look good. At the moment, it doesn't look good. In fact, when you go to the next page, uh, it also, in fact, on the same page, it talks about whether the government is doing enough to fight corruption. On the same page, 29, the second part, uh, those without an opinion remain the same between April and July. Uh, those who say, yes, the government is doing enough to fight corruption, 23% in April, 14% in July, nine percentage points lost. And then for those who say, no, government is not doing enough, in April it was 66%, now it's 74%. No surprises in there, right? Not at all, not at all. And uh, it, it moves in the same direction as the, uh, the earlier question. It directly correlated. And uh, people don't see government doing enough, to be very honest with you. And if, in fact, if you remember, we did uh, last time, there was a survey about the uh, Office of the Special Prosecutor, whether they have confidence that they can deal with it. And people didn't have confidence. Once people begin to have confidence in the OSP and the concrete steps government is taking, specifically on corrupt act and practices, we should see an improvement. Until that, I don't think this can improve or will improve. Let me come to Dr. Osai uh, Kwapong. When, when you go to the next page, uh, in fact, page 32 now, you would notice that this conversation we're having, of course, I would like you to talk, on, talk a bit about the corruption-related matter, but also look at the standard of living in the last 12 months. It makes for interesting uh, reading. Those without an opinion, 7% in April, 4% in July. Those who feel uh, their standard of living in the last 12 months has improved, 15% in 
in April, 10% now, another loss of five percentage points, and change to those who feel things are okay, still what they were. 28% in April, 22% now, uh, an eight percentage point decline. But those who feel the situation has worsened, 50% in April, 63% now. That's a difference of 13%. Uh, percent. How do you reflect on that? Corruption, uh, per the, the, the various studies, the UN ODC study, uh, the Afrobarometer report, and now uh, the Global Info Analytics, and also the standard of living. Sure. So um, if you would indulge me for 10 seconds, I just want to really commend uh, Dr. Tia Mohammed for his response to the, to the service. It's, it's very refreshing to see someone in government see poll results that is not favorable and not quote unquote uh, rubbish it. And so I, I, am, I am quite pleasantly both surprised, but also very appreciative of the fact that he acknowledges that uh, the survey results do send some signals about uh, discontent with, uh, with government performance. So having said that, if you look at, again, the corruption, uh, the corruption questions uh, from Global Info Analytics, and you also look at the corruption report from uh, GSS, uh, the UN agency, as well as SHRAD, um, you do see that there's, there's really a growing perception of how rife uh, the issue of bribery and corruption is in the, uh, in the public sector. In fact, um, we are yet to see the results from, on corruption from Afrobarometer Round 9, uh, 2022. But if you look at the last couple of rounds of Afrobarometer, one of the questions that I always look at when they ask, you know, how many of the following do you think are involved in corruption? Um, one of the response choices is none. And I use that to gauge the extent to which citizens give institutions and public officials a clean bill of health. And over the last couple of rounds of Afrobarometer, you are seeing no more than 5% um, of Ghanaians saying that none of these individuals across institutions, police, presidency, MPs, et cetera, et cetera. So again, it does you know, it, it does resonate with what others are finding in terms of, you know, the, the corruption situation. The other point that I want to quickly make, though, is that when I looked at the GSS UN Shraj report, what I found very instructive is comparing the, the contact rate for these institutions vis-a-vis -vis the bribery rate and then the value of the bribery. And you would, you would see that there are instances where there are certain institutions with very low contact rate. Um, so, for example, prosecutors, judges, magistrates, the contact rate with the public, as captured in the survey, is 1.7%. But then the bribery rate is it's very high. Very, very high, right? If you look at Lands Commission, they have a contact rate of just 3.4%, but a bribery rate of 34%, and they have the highest... Um, bribery uh, value. The size, 1,669 uh, cities. Right. The police have been, you know, getting all of the headlines. But if you look at it, the police has, what, a 36% contact rate. Yes, a high 59% bribery rate. But on the list of the institutions, the value of the bribery is 12. Uh, they are 12 in the ranking. I'm not saying that that excuses that institution, but I think one of the things we need to also really probe is to try and understand why public officials or public institutions with such low contact rates do have high bribery rates. Because that means that for those institutions, uh, who are not that visible to the public, the cost of transaction between them and the citizens um, is quite high because of the, uh, of the, of the bribery rate. Mm. And it's, it's good you've gone into uh, that bit there. I just wanted us to take a look at the UN ODC uh, document as well to note some very important aspects uh, of it, and you've already started uh, doing that. So it talks about bribery in the public sector. And, and, and anyway, maybe I should quickly ask um, Dr. Mahama about this. What has happened to the National Anti-Corruption Action Plan adopted in 2014? I mean, if you know something about it, you can tell us. If not, 
but but what has happened to it? Yeah, I think that uh, the 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 plan was what I mean determined the present decision to set up the office of the special prosecutor, mm. the linking that particular prosecutor from the attorney from general. The attorney general. And basically, that action plan is what is being implemented through the office of the special prosecutor. But the president, I mean, the current prosecutor, we all admit that he's doing extremely well. He's trying to uh, be on top of the issues. But the issue of corruption is more about the reality of it and the perception of it. Mm. Because, look, if we have to admit, we have to go back to the words of the president, John Kufo when he said that corruption is as old as Adam. It's mm. been with us since that era of I mean, Adam. This statement was twisted and it was taken to mean that, look, he's not ready to fight corruption. But if you look but, at but every... What, 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 every wasn't, wasn't that a bit of a shift when... Because the start was zero tolerance for corruption. Of course, when you come and say corruption has been with us since... The yeah, when you say Adam, zero tolerance for I corruption... Mean, it, I, I love the man, Kufo, but you, you would want to hold him... Yeah, you would, you would, you would. But when you take his words, if you say zero tolerance for corruption, basically you are telling, you are telling us that, look, I'm coming to fight corruption. But when you come to face the reality, and you know that the situation is even more within, outside the control of government, look, from the streets, from the individual level, from the household level, they have been corrupt. They have, I mean, we've all been corrupt. Mm. This country, we are all being hypocrit hypocritical about the issue of corruption. Oh, we're being hypocritical? We are very hypocritical about the issue of corruption. And let me, let me let, tell let, you let, let, me, let me just ask you this. Yeah. When was the last time you were corrupt? Since you say we are all corrupt. I'm saying that we are being hypocritical about corruption because, look, I sit in my office. Mm. People come to my office. Mm. The only source of income I get is my salary. Mm -hmm. But they expect you to pay school fees. They expect you to pay hospital Even bills. you? Yes. Wow. Even when I'm not a government, a so to call, a, what you call, an MP or a minister of state, you do all those things. If you don't how, do... How do you manage? Basically, these are more personal. These are more personal. I'm sure that these are issues will go into, into another time. But basically, this is, the, this is how serious the situation is. Mm -hmm. That is how serious the situation is. So if people... And you know what? If you are stand on corruption, if you are a government that wants to fight corruption, the people will punish you. And the very people who are crying that corruption is loud, they will not even come to your aid. But, but let me ask you this. I, I always say this. You know, Singapore, before they became what they are now, it took them about 30 years. Yeah. The mindset, if you read Lee Kuan Yew's yeah. from third world to first, was very much like ours. It takes time to change a mindset. But once you change it, people accept it, and then you move from there. Have you contemplated the British centuries ago? It, yeah. it, it, it reminds you of Thomas Hobbes, what he says, life is poor, nasty, brutish, and short. They had to come out of that. My, my point is, if we keep crying wolf in this regard and say that, oh, the people will punish you, then it means that we'll always lack the political will and nobody will take responsibility, which means then that the system is going to remain what it is, at infinitum, forever. I agree with you that government has to take responsibility and if it demands a government falling for a different regime to come to, to set the system, I don't have problem with that at all. And this government, through its very acts of fighting corruption, has been penalized. And I can mention several, with the special prosecutor, we, we, I mean, is going after Sir John. People thought that it was corruption, but he went to the court and found and that the law did not favor him. When government institution is fighting other government institution. It throws sunshine on the issue of corruption. Then the discussion in the media is out there that, look, there are corruption activity. When the media is doing its work and revealing corrupt practices, he tattoo was hidden, people would think that this government is more corrupt than the government before. Mm. But that is not the issue. It's just that the media is now more proactive. They are now more daring. They are now more stronger and versatile in their research Techniques. But, but, that's what but as we know it, a lot of the issues that have been brought up to you, and I can list quite a number of them, the response has been lethargic at best. And, um, you know, let's, I mean, you, you have instances where a body is supposed to address this before you realize the police has come in, there's a clearance, and then we're back to square one. People whose hands have, like I was sharing in my blunt thoughts, people whose hands have basically been caught in the cookie jar what the legal people will say, in flagrante delicto. What happened? Yeah, if your hand is caught in the cookie jar, it means that you are, you are caught, I mean, passed down. You are basically caught in the act. 
and that there's no reason why you should, I mean, there's no exculpatory explanation for that particular act. But basically, then we are living in a country of law again. If there are deficiencies in the law, we should rather address that. But once we are living in a legal regime, that the person have, I mean, there's some, uh, what do you call, safety for that person in the law. There's some refuge for that person in the law. You cannot blame the government for that. Look, mm. the law empowers each and every Ghanaian to take so, any so who is who is in charge of dealing with the law? You say, you say uh, the law creates loopholes yeah. for people to engage in this, and sometimes it's difficult for the law because... You, you have the criminal code and you have the penal code, which determines what punishment goes yeah. for what. So if there's a loophole there, the law really can't get you. But you in government, especially your members of parliament, then determine what the law should be. So if you want to shape the law, you have ample opportunity to do so. Parliament is, a, is an arm of government, but its autonomy is supposed to be respected. And I think that laws are, that's why executive doesn't make law. Okay, point, point made. Let, 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 me, let me get to this as we get ready to wrap the conversation, gentlemen. Uh, there's also this bit, of course, there's a bit about 26.7% of the adult population paying a bribe to a public official in 2021. But I want us to look at this uh, before we end the conversation. There are also these permutations that you put out, Musa. And you suggest uh, that uh, if elections were to be held per the statistics you got from your survey, 58% of Ghanaians would vote for former President Mahama, and uh, interestingly, he bears your name, <laughs> and 31% in that hypothetical race would vote for Vice President Baumia. When it comes to uh, Alan Chemating, it widens to 61% for Mahama, and, and the rest going to uh, Alan Chemating. Uh, give us a bit of an explanation about how you randomized this, got this figure, and how reflective you feel it is of the reality. And so this question will go to you. It will go to, and please unmute, uh, Mr. Dankwa. It will go to you, it will go to Dr. Osai Kwapong, and it will come to you as well as we get ready to wrap. Right, I mean, we've mentioned the methodology already, which is randomized, and across the 75 constituencies. These are simply aggregation of views from the voters, unweighted data from the poll. And in that uh, response, 31% of voters are going to vote for uh, Dr. Mahmoud Baumir, and 58% are voting for John Mahama, and 11% said somebody else. Now, if you look at Alan, Alan has performed a bit bad this time around. It's now on 30%. And Mahama on 61%. Mm. Now, what has caused this dramatic shift is one reason. Two, in the last poll, Dr. Baumia wasn't doing well in the Eastern region. He's recovered a bit in the Eastern region. And then secondly, the Northern region has proven to be a bit complicated in this round of poll. When John Mahama is running against Baumia, the entire Northern region both MPP and NDC affiliates coalesce around Dr. Mahmoud Baumia and vote for him. So John Mahama was performing abysmally against Mahama in the Northern region. But when Baumia isn't on the ticket and is Allah, the entire Northern region switch sides I and see. now vote for His Excellency Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, sorry, uh, John Mahama. So that dramatic shift which moves vote from MPP to NBC column as what caused Alan to look very vulnerable or very uh, shaky in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the national poll compared to uh, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. Okay, all right, uh, uh, apt there. Dr. Osai Kwapong, maybe a minute on this and I'll come to you with, with a minute and we're done. Yes, again, um, um, it's if it's capturing the mood of the electorate, as I've already said, um, a very difficult uh, political terrain. Um, again, nobody knows exactly how the results of the election would shape up in terms of the actual percentages. But again, if I were if I were an incumbent government looking at these numbers, um, I would um, I would be worried. But at the same time, I would also say to myself, between now and twenty twenty four which of the stacks are stacked up against me 
And do I have enough time to be able to change some of the narrative? Do I have enough time to turn things around to you know, improve my, uh, my, uh, my political prospects in the 2024 election? But at least where we stand today, um, I'm, I'm sure most observers would, would, uh, would acknowledge the fact that the opposition is in a, in a, in a, in a stronger position and the incumbent a lot more vulnerable. But we'll see what happens between now and 2024. All right, the final bite to you. I have a little thing I'll add the, at the end for, in just <laughs> five minute. seconds. But, but All right, thank you very much. I just, I just want to associate with uh, Dr. Osai Kopong on this. I think when this results come up, uh, the, the, the government would have to do some work in order to turn things around. And that work will require that, look, the challenges that we are facing in this particular economy has to be fixed. But if you look at the analysis between Dr. Mahmoud Bawume and then uh, His Excellency uh, John uh, Drahmani Mahamang, you realize that, look, people are basically vented out the current sentiment in the way they see the, the election. But I believe that when the two are even going to go to the pool, a lot of factors will then come into of play. Of course, many dynamics. Many will dynamics will then come into play. So basically, this is not, and I mean, my brother Musa also admitted to that, this is not basically to tell us that, look, this is the outcome of the 2024 election, but just giving a sense of the things that people... I mean, it's a probability. It's, it's hypothetical. hypothetical. It's hypothetical. Great. So that is what they are going to do. And I'm happy that, look, this results is showing that there is a future for the MPP at least, through either Dr. Mahmoud Bawumia or Alan Chiramante, there is some prospect with the two. So and the MPP will break the eight? The MPP has what it takes to break the eight. We have to do some work, of course. If we address the challenge, if the Ghanaian people do not feel, feel hardship, I think the MPP will always be... And mind you, our results, our survey shows that, look, when it comes to numerical strength, with the two-party core supporters, MPP is slightly ahead of the NDC in terms of their core basis. Right. What determines who wins is the floating voters. How we treat these particular floating voters is going to determine whether we can break the eight or not. And government is very focused on, on I mean, All right. So, on that. so, so j just to wrap, in 10 seconds, uh, if I gave you the Ghana card versus a thousand interchanges, which one would you pick? I would choose the Ghana card. Let me explain why. Okay. Look. The Ghana card. Fifteen seconds. Everybody. The Ghana card has a potential of giving us tens of thousands of interchanges because when we have a proper addressing system, proper identification, risk of credit becomes high, investment goes up, GDP goes up, and you can get more money in order to. On, on what roads will the people travel to do the things you? Have That's to do. what I'm saying. The Ghana, if we don't address systems, we don't build countries by. Monuments. We build a country a by road systems. is part of the system. No, the road is not. Road is an it's infrastructure. Road, road is, in fact, it's an infrastructure. The system on which to develop the road, if it's not strong, the road will, de will, will I mean, the integers will, what you call, collapse. And you will not even have a way of rehabilitating them. So and what the Ghana the, card will do. And the Ghana card, the Ghana card, the Ghana card, the Ghana card is a vehicle. But, but it's a vehicle. So when the vice the president said that the Ghana card, he would choose the Ghana card over a thousand integers. He was basically trying to avert the minds of Ghana. Look, this Ghana card has the potential of increasing the revenue revenue base of this particular country. It has the potential of directing this particular financial sector. It has the potential of ensuring proper identity and social safety and targeting of the populace. Basically, that was what he was trying to say. All right, point made. Uh, I, I, I would just say that you should also communicate with Professor Atefua, my good friend, <laughs> and others that, look, a lot of people need their Ghana cards okay. and they are waiting in queue. Okay. It's a good thing. Thank and you let's, let's keep it up. But thank you very much, uh, guests, uh, Dr. Kabiru Mahama from the Office of the Vice President. We had Musa Dankwa, Executive Director, Global Info Analytics. We also had Dr. Osai uh, Kwapong, CDD uh, Fellow. Up next, stay with us because uh, the Defense and Interior Committee of Parliament is recommending a bipartisan committee to further investigate the happenings uh, on Friday the 17th of June at the Islamic SHS in Kumasi. We'll also bring you snippets from uh, today's Habitat Fair kicking off. Stay with us. Good morning to you. Thank you so much for staying on the John News channel. This is still the AM show. 
and uh, Benjamin Akaku brought you that conversation earlier and it's now time to focus on other stories. The Defence and Interior Committee of Parliament is recommending a bipartisan committee to further investigate uh, the police shooting incident at the Islamic SHS in Kumasi on Friday, June 17. The committee was directed by the Speaker of Parliament, Alban Babin, to embark on a fact-finding mission and report to the House. Well, we've been joined by ranking member uh, of the Defence and Interior Committee of Parliament to find out why the need for further investigation after uh, the report was presented to uh, the House. Good morning to you, sir. Thanks for your time. Good. Right, so uh, the chairman of your committee, Kennedy Japan, presented the report to the House. The Police service itself is conducting internal investigations. In fact, two top officials of the service in the Ashanti region were interdicted. Four others were interdicted. The IGP was in Kumasi, clearly unhappy about the situation. Why is there a need for more investigation on this matter? Well, to start with, the speaker's own directive to the committee was for the committee to... Um, make a fact-finding mission and report back to uh, the House. So the scope of mandate of the committee from the outset was not well defined because when you talk about a fact-finding mission, you are simply saying that the committee should go to Kumasi, establish the bare facts, but we see in the course of attempting to establish even the bare facts of the case, you are in a way carrying out some form of investigation. But because the police has already commenced their own investigation, and we subsequently also realized that the regional directorate of education has also set up some uh, committee to investigate the circumstances surrounding the um, atrocity that were unleashed on the, 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 the students. We, it was very difficult for us to um, navigate around the thin line between a fact-finding mm -hmm. and an investigation. Okay. Nevertheless, we engaged the stakeholders uh, who were involved in the um, if you like, the riot, the attempt to um, get the students to receive medical attention, etc. Mm -hmm. The school authorities were engaged, were engaged the police, and um, at the end of the day, it was very clear that if care was not taken, there would be some cover-ups. For instance, we visited the Asante Regional Police Command, and when we spoke to um, some of the police officers who were themselves injured in the course of trying to control the crowd, it became clear to us that there were some inconsistencies in some of the things they told us. So we came back not very um, excited. In the meantime, we are awaiting the outcome of the police own investigation. Now, because members of the committee noticed that there were a lot of inconsistencies when they, for instance, engaged the police officers who sustained injury, we thought that, look, we would do the public a lot of good if we were asked or mandated to investigate the matter and not to allow the police to investigate themselves. Right, Mr. Galga, I'll come back to you to find out uh, some of the key uh, facts you were able to gather on this fact-finding mission. But we know the police is also investigating this matter. In fact, uh, the service has admitted that poor tactics were used in that particular incident. Would you want to wait for the police's investigation before you uh, decide if it is actually necessary to set up another bipartisan committee to probe the matter. So there's no duplication, per se. Well, I think right from the outset, um, the speaker's own directive um, actually left room 
for Parliament itself to actually take up the matter and investigate if the outcome of the police um, own investigation turned out to be unsatisfactory. So, so that was the case yes, right from the outset. But um, after visiting Kumasi and having some interaction with some police officers, and I'll just give you one example. For mm -hmm. instance, the police account, those who were injured, seven of them were injured, was that the day had to I mean, use force, including firing life ammunition, because they saw some of the students of um, the Islamic High Senior School in Kumasi will catalyze it, it. And those are dangerous weapons. And so that is why they decided to fire. But when we probed further <laughs> to ask whether they were able to retrieve that lasted from the students because they had pursued the students even when the students retreated back to campus. You see? Mm -hmm. Now, when we questioned them whether they at least had been able to receive even one catalyst, their responses were very unconvincing. Not a single catalyst was retrieved. So, but the, the, that um, storyline was, was never corroborated by the school authorities, the students, etc. They said no, they only pelted them with stones when they tried to uh, break through the, um, the school security gate. And that was when they also then decided to defend themselves by pelting them with stones. So um, it appears there were a lot of inconsistencies, mm. which is why uh, we, in our own view, thought that look, if care is not taken, there will be some cover up. Yeah, but like you said, we don't want to have um, multiple investigations which may end up um, giving different accounts and uh, results. So I think the best approach would be for us to wait for the IGP investigation to conclude. And when they submit their report and we go through, those gaps, for all you know, they have also taken account of the inconsistencies we uh, unraveled when we traveled to Kumasi. If they do, then there would be a real basis for us to plunge into a full blown bipartisan investigation. Mm. So uh, finally, Mr. Galga, apart from the inconsistencies you discovered in the accounts of the police officers on what exactly transpired leading to their injuries, what other uh, facts were you able to gather surrounding this incident? Yes, yeah, so um, first of all, well, it came to light that um, the reason why the police used live ammunition, they used some, I should say, excessive force, was probably because they lacked appropriate crowd control here. I mean, come to think of the fact that the police officers who sustained injury, and there were seven of them, they, who sustained injury, head injury, I mean, injury in the legs and all that. Why? I mean, you see, if, you, if they had the shield with that typical crowd control equipment, pelting of stone shouldn't be a problem. You felt the sword and they use they would use the shield to protect themselves. Mm. But at the time they were deployed to control the crowd, they simply did not have the shield, appropriate crowd control here. And so what they had was the AK forty seven and live ammunition. They didn't even have um, adequate stocks of rubber bullets. So they were forced to use what they had. And therefore, it was very clear that the police themselves are not well resourced when it comes to uh, the provision of adequate crowd control uh, here. And that is an area government needs to look at very critically. And then we also um, came to the conclusion that the 
the disturbances were in a way justified, even though we're not too happy that the students uh, took the law into their hands. Look, for well over 10 years, the school authorities had been writing to government and asking government to intervene mm. because there were a series of accidents on the frontage of the school between involving motorists, pedestrians, students, and staff. So many accidents on countless occasions. So, and for well over 10 years, they kept complaining, and yet government intervention was zero, or if you like, very like a basical. So, so on, on, on the fateful day when the demonstration happened, there was the rumor that a female student vehicle had been run into by an oncoming uh, vehicle, resulting in the death of the student. That was the trigger. But it turned out that that was just a rumor, a, a business rumor. They, yes, an accident did okay, but the student didn't die. So that was what incensed the students, and they poured onto the street. You see, took the laws in their own hands and uh, blocked traffic flow, and, and it eventually resulted in the police own intervention. Mm. So that was yet another factor. And um, you would see that in our report, we actually called for the director of Ever Road to be sanctioned because this is something they could easily have um, intervened. When the police first visited the scene, the IGP on its own was able to provide ropes, you know, to serve as temporary uh, speed ramp to, to save the lives of the students. So what it simply means is that if our institutions were uh, working and serious, this matter could easily have been averted. So those were uh, 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 some of the findings. We also uh, clearly noticed that, look, the, the, a lot needed to be done to improve upon the uh, discipline on mm. campus. Because Kumasi Senior High School is about the most popular in the country. And yet, <laughs> they lack certain basic facilities. So the headmaster is not resident on campus. And you see, when a headmaster is not resident on campus, it undermines the discipline, the control of the student. Right. So, so we, we brought all these things to the fore. I mean, they are captured in the report mm. for government's attention. I appreciate your time here this morning. James Agalga is ranking member of the Defence and Interior Committee in Parliament. And we've just been talking about that recommendation by his committee for a bipartisan probe into the incident that occurred earlier in June at the Islamic SHS, leaving uh, some students injured, police officers as well. When we come back, I'll be giving you a reason to stay glued to the Draw News Channel this weekend. We are launching a new program and premiering our uh, documentary in commemoration of the 10th anniversary of the death of former President John Evans Tamils to stay. Thank you for staying on the AM show. Now, Sunday, the 24th of July 2022, will be 10 years since the passing of former President John Evans Atamels. And I don't know where you were on that day, how the news was broken to you, but I remember vividly where I was and my reaction after that. But here at Joy News, we choose to celebrate him as one of Ghana's greats, and that's why we've dedicated this 10th anniversary to producing a documentary about who he was, what he stood for, what he's remembered for. And producer of that particular edition of Ghana's Greats, Parkwesi Shandov, joins me in studio with more. Parkwesi, yeah, great nice. work. I've seen excerpts of that documentary. I can't wait to watch the full thing. But tell us exactly what we see in that documentary. What's the focus point? Who are we likely to hear from? Mm. So um, that particular documentary uh, seeks to highlight his personhood as an individual 
and then his efforts in, in, in government as president mm -hmm. uh, of the republic. So basically, we'll be uh, taking a journey. We'll begin, we back on a journey from the time he was born all the way to the time he ventured into the political arena. And of course, we'll also shine the light on his academic endeavors as well. Because typically, Prof is an academic. He's a lecturer before he, he embraced the mantle of becoming the flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress in 2000. Then subsequently, in 2008, uh, he won the election. Now, the people to be um, hearing from, uh, we have um, Samuel Koku Ahindo. Now, he was the uh, former director of communications at the presidency. And then we also have Atamilsa's biological brother. And then we have, you know, some of his colleagues back in the university. And then we also have his son. Yes, he, his son gave a lot of chilling accounts with respect to how he welcomed the news, the rapport between himself and the president, and a lot of very uh, juicy stuff, mm. I should say. Right. I, I mean, like I said, fingers crossed. I can't wait to see this. But mm. tell us what times and on what channels we can watch this documentary. All right. So it, it would be here on the Joy News channel. On um, Sunday, it would be at 9 p.m. That is Sunday, the 24th of July. 9, not 8. Yes, 9 p.m. Okay. That, that would be on Sunday. And that happens to be um, the 10th anniversary as well, I mean, following his death. Then on Monday, it would be uh, 8 p.m., still on the uh, Joy News um, channel. Mm. Let me put you on the spot here. I mean, we, uh, he was our president, mm. so we all knew him a bit. We knew mm. him from afar. Mm. I mean, he was a humble person. He was strict, you know, when it came to, came to issues of dealing with corruption. Absolutely. And uh, there are people who say that, look, this man, if he had stayed longer, uh, maybe we would see that he, he actually was who he was and it was no pretense. Mm. You know, he would have gone the long haul with his, his, his personality, his values and all that. Absolutely. What in this documentary shocked you? Well, let me see. What's the new thing you learned about him speaking to the people he worked with mm. and the people who were close to him, his relatives? Right. Now, you, you, you do remember, or of course, you can relate to the fact that everybody described him as a very peaceful character, and that is what earned him the name as Sumdrehini. But apart from that, I mean, based on the engagements we had that um, constituted the content of the documentary, we also realized that he was remarkably um, humble, more than all that we had seen. So, Koko Hindu, for example, gave accounts of how the president, you know, um, rejected privileges that a lot of people ordinarily, ordinarily would have accepted, okay, as, as president. I mean, he was not um, so fascinated about long convoys and having to live in plush, you know, apartments and all of that. And all of those were valid attestations of, of his humility and his, his knack for I mean, a very modest approach, you know, to life. That, that, that shocked me because, of course, if, if you weather through all the impediments of, you know, a very tough election and you become president, ordinarily you would expect that, look, you should embrace some kind of comfort. But Mills never embraced anything like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know that he was quite religious. Huh? Absolutely. Did, did that, does that, that feature? That featured prominently. And thanks for, uh, I mean, prompting me on that note as well. Now... Apparently, even when he had to venture into politics, he didn't see it as so flamboyant that he embraced it all of a sudden. No, he took the decision to God and he had to pray consistently before ac accepting the invitation from former President Rawlings to be you know, his running mate in the very first place. And there was a clergy who was praying consistently uh, with him. He spoke extensively on that particular note as well. So Mills was not the kind of president who was thinking about policies only from the intellectual perspective. He wanted the spiritual resonation as well. What is God saying? And that, I thought, was very striking. Very, very striking. Mm, interesting. Yeah, uh, interesting. Uh, and I, 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 do, do we hear from his colleagues on the other side, like uh, the NPP or the other new, political parties? No, no, we would, we would not hear from them. Okay. No, but of course, all of them attested to his persona, the kind of warm person he was. Well, there was a little bit of an angle about them. You know, when Mills took power, there was pressure. Pressure was being mounted on him to 
crack the whip on his dissenters and all those who had accused him. You're right. But, but Mill said, look... Uh, I'm not in for the witch hunting. I'm not in for the witch hunting. I mean, there was a, he had a press conference and someone came to ask him a question mm -hmm. that he has plans of wanting to remove the chief justice. You know, in a very humorous fashion, he said, does it look like, you know, a cat hunter? And he just, you know, <laughs> you know took it off. So Mills was, I mean, yeah. spectacular. In, in wrapping this up, where were you... When you heard of his demise and how did it hit you? <laughs> I, I recall with 100% exactitude. Now that is because that Tuesday um, I, I was in high school. We had finished, I, I used to lead um, 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 scripture union prayer meetings. So we had finished, we had prayed and all. I was right here at um, um, the Kwame Nkrumah Circle. I had entered a car and then the, the mate started shouting, Atao, you see, he was saying Atao man. But of course, that is, you know, a, a derogatory term that has been used already. So it didn't really strike my thought, oh, this guy was being propagandist. The car moved a little bit further. And then that was when I, you know, the driver opened, you know, the radio and all of us were, you know, broken. So from school, going home and all of that, it was very, very devastating. And when I went home, of course, my dad, mom, they were by the television set, oh, Atta is gone, everybody. Yeah. Very sad day. Yeah, very, very sad day it was. Yeah. I remember vividly where yeah. I was. And uh, like Pa Kwesi says, I mean, you hear of people's deaths, but a certain president dying, that was another ball game altogether. Uh, but I think that um, it's worth celebrating him, who he was, what he stood for, and his contribution to this nation's uh, socio-political development. Right, so do make a date on the 24th of July at 9 p.m. and on the 25th of July at 8, 8 p.m. here on the Joy News channel. You can also catch it live on Facebook if you're not close to your TV set at that particular time. All right, Pakwiti, let's move on. Um, there's something else happening this weekend <laughs> aside from this. And yes. you're launching a new program. Mm. Uh, tell us what it's about and uh, why people should should watch it. Okay, so Joy Campus. Now, if you look at the country's demography, of course, we have a very youthful population. And normally, the rhetoric has been that it's the young people who would eventually translate into the mainstream national life and occupy positions and all of that. If all of those assertions are true, then it, it behooves us to, as it were, shine the light on them. L let's see what young people are doing. What are they thinking? What are their ideals? What are the values they are embracing and all of that, particularly those at the tertiary institutions. And that essentially underscores the essence of Joy Campus. So what Joy Campus is seeking to do is to project young people, particularly those in tertiary, I mean, on, in the various tertiary uh, institutions. But the way I am communicating it, if you are hearing me, you may think it's very strict and hard. No, we have, you know, a lot yeah, of fun. Yes. Like young yes. people love to. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> so SRC week celebrations, you know, campus trips, you know, what happened? I mean, generally, life on, on campus, mm. I mean, that is basically what uh, a Joy Campus is all about. And, and it's, it's going to air the Sunday at 11 a.m., mm. starting from the nation's premier university, the University of Ghana. Benis, I don't know why you... Yeah, you because you're an old student of the University well, of Ghana. Well, 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 And Commonwealth Hall in particular. Okay. So we're going to focus on the, the Vandals. They have a brand. They say that they are vivacious, they are ABC, you know. And, you know, there's a lot of myths surrounding the entire Vandal, you know, fraternity. Some people have asserted that it's it's a cult and, yes. well, all of those would be demystified. All right. Uh, on, on so, so you do this with the... One of our colleagues? Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. yes. Faustina Safo? Yes, Faustina yes. Safo. Great. Faustina Safo. Yeah. Okay, so it's at 11 a.m. So you watch yeah. that at 11 a.m. on Sunday, July 24. And then later at 9 p.m. you catch the documentary mm. on former President John Evans Atamos. Great. I would love to watch that. Sure. Because uh, the first time I saw the Vandals in action, I was shocked. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a conversation for another day. Absolutely. But that's Park Wesi Shandoff, uh, my colleague, producer of the Ghana Greats um, Professor John Evans at Tamil's edition, and also a co host of our new program, uh, Joy, Joy Campus. Campus. Great. Moving on, Joy News in partnership with Echo Bank, the Pan African Bank, and the Plant City Extension Project from Cities and Habitats 
will make home ownership easy. This year's fair is another theme, home ownership where you live matters. At the Ecobank Joining Habitat Fair, we got you covered with all your needs for mortgages, personal loans, consumer financing, land acquisition, security, and many more. Join us at the Achimota Retail Center for the first clinic from today, Friday, July 2022, to Sunday, July 2024, uh, 2022, from 8 a.m. To 8 p.m. daily. There will be exciting activities including webinars, giveaways, and many more. Please call 54 or 54 for more inquiries. And uh, the Ecobank Journeys Habitat Fair in partnership with Ecobank, the Pan African Bank, is powered by the Plant Cities Extension Project uh, from Cities and Habitats Rent to Own. It's sponsored by Elegant Homes and General Construction Limited. Where quality meets value, virtual security Africa, complete security solutions, Superlock Technologies Limited, you deserve the best, DBS Industries Limited, we truly are your roof experts, Duraplast Limited, where Duraplast goes, water flows, Gold Key Properties Building, prestige since 1997, Ecobank Joinies Habitat Fair, where you live matters. So I'll be crossing over shortly to my colleague, my colleague I beg your pardon, uh, ben, Ben just left here. He is at the Achimota Retail Center. Hello, Benjamin. Uh, that was a quick one, a quick dash to Achimota. <laughs> Tell us what's happening. Hi, Bernice, and it's a real pleasure uh, being here because of what I am seeing uh, from the Echo Bank uh, Joy News Habitat Fair. So it's magnificent. Like you can see, this is the Achimota Retail Center and uh, the place is a hubbub of activity. I see so many uh, of uh, those participants in this first clinic of the Ecobank Joy News Habitat Fairs and, and we are here because where you live uh, matters. We have so many of these uh, entities here. We have building entities, we have Superlock uh, Technologies, Sukasa is here, we have uh, DBS Roofing, DBS Industries, Virtual Security Africa, Homeland Toys and many more. But you know what, let's start interacting with some of them as we bring you sights and sounds of the Ecobank Joy News Habitat uh, Fair. I'll start with Superlock Technologies Limited and uh, we have Mr. Bediako Kwabi who joins uh, the conversation. Mr. Bediako Kwabi. A very good morning to you. Good morning, Benji. How are you? Uh, I'm very well. Because of the smiles on your face, I can see you are happy. You're excited to be here. But you are with Superlock Technologies Limited. Uh, tell us a bit about what you do. Okay, so um, uh, good morning to your viewers once again. Um, Superlock, um, we are into building products. Um, building product, if I say building product, what I mean is that after uh, construction, after you've built your house and roofed it and you're about to plaster, Come to Superlock for all you need for the house, which is um, security doors, internal doors, burglar proofs, balustrades. We are doing kitchens, we are doing pergola, and all the products that you need to finish your house, mm. basically. I see some work ongoing here, a setup. Can you tell us a bit about what is happening uh, here right now? Okay, so here you see our security doors being installed. Um, Look, like I said, I have the best security door you can find in the market. So they are installing, this is a four-course uh, security door um, stand. So here you can see all the various types of security. We have the, the design security door, we have the basic security door, and we have the other designs. I mean, um, I, I think once, once I said in one of your platforms that um, I have the best security door you can find in the country, is a Israeli technology, and also, um, if we talk about security, the strength of the door, the, the, the material used to produce is a governance steel material. The weight is about uh, 50 kg. Look, you see a very fantastic product uh, here in the fair. Come, and I'm inviting everybody. <laughs> All right, I, and I'm sure those watching us, uh, looking at the, uh, the, the times we are in, would be thinking, uh, <laughs> uh, what's the cost factor like? <laughs> Of course, um, everybody should come. You will have your, your package, okay? Look, here I'm even giving some discounts, some fantastic discounts. So whatever you need, you come. There is always a way out, okay? The cost 
we can we can bait. All so, right, we can deal with the cost. Exactly. Let's quickly do the Superlock Technologies Limited, uh, Mr. Bediako Kwabi. Let's check out some other entities. Uh, come with me as we come to Sukasa Properties. Sukasa Properties. And uh, we're here with, uh, you are? Uh, my name is Ibrahim Dazi. Ibrahim Dazi. And? Hannah. Hannah. Okay. So which one of you is going to get interactive? You are. All right. I see Sukasa there. In Spanish, your house. You know, where you live matters. Where you live uh, matters. Building on trust. Uh, tell us a bit about Sukasa Properties. Okay. So we are a real estate company. We deal in affordable homes. Uh, current locations are East Legon Hills and Ayi Mensa. We have two, three, four bedroom. And the amazing thing about us is that our three and four bedrooms actually come with boys' quarters. And then we have other amenities that come also as well. The pool, the gym, the playground, and many others that I don't want to disclose everything to you now. So walk into our office at any time at East Legon, Lagos Avenue, and then we'll give you all the information you need. Um, I don't know. What are your prices like? Okay, so our prices start from 400,000 Ghana CD for the two bedroom, 560,000 Ghana CD for the three bedroom, and 840,000 CD for the four bedroom. You also have the options of extending your your plot. So depending on how, uh, like the size you want to extend it to, we'll also price you per that as well. And then our houses also come with like kitchen cabinets, kitchen island, b uh, built-in wardrobe, water tank, um, what, 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 what again? I mean, there's so much things that I can't even remember. Everything. And all our bedrooms are en suite, all of them. So imagine like the price you're getting for the mansion you're getting. It's amazing. And, and what makes, what does it for me is the fact that you, you peg it at a stable level. So for example, the 560,000 three bedroom facility, you peg it at 70,000. If we're using today's exchange rate, it would be higher, but exactly. you peg it at $70,000 exactly. and that's it. Yes, exactly. That's it. And there are no hidden charges. Obviously, you live in a community, so you will pay service charges for the pool, playground, and other stuff. But there are no hidden charges whatsoever where you'll be like, oh, you have to pay. No, Sukasa is not like that. We are very open. We are very clear. And we are expanding in many, many, many locations now. Hmm. Well, Sukasa, Mikasa. Thank you very much uh, for joining the conversation. They are in East Legon and Ayi Mensa heading towards Ebri. Let's uh, trot along and uh, catch some other entities that are here with us today. How about we do DBS Industries uh, Limited? Hello, good morning. Okay, so I see I see them pointing to you. It means one hour share official win into one hour bekasa. What do you say? What's your name? I'm James, uh, Head of Sales and Marketing. All right, James, Head of Sales and Marketing. What can you tell us about DBS Industries? Uh, I think uh, DBS is, is becoming a one-stock uh, shop house. You know, initially we started with roofing, and now we have added concrete products to uh, our, our, our profiles. Yeah. So someone say roofing, Papa Pefi. Papa Pefi. So I started roofing. How can DBS? We are in say we are into roofing, but what to me? But my woman say we have concrete products. We have the six inches solid. We have the hollow, we have the pavement blocks, we have the pavement caps, and we have a ready mixed concrete as well. Mm. Yeah. What, what makes DBS Industries stand out? I think uh, for the roofing side, it's because of the warranty we issue to our customers. Uh, if you do a purchase on our coloring products, we ensure that we give you 20 years warranty against fading. Yeah. 20-year mm. warranty against uh, fading. Yes, so for your other, uh, other products, what, what is the warranty? The warranty, we don't have a warranty on this, uh, but these are very, if you could see the, the even the color of uh, this product and the accuracy of the product, you could see it's, it's, a, it's a very high quality. And mm. we use uh, German machines in manufacturing some of this product. Uh, let's look at the block like this, see how straight the block is compared to what you have outside. Mm. And when you are using such blocks, you don't even need a lot of mortar for your plastering, yeah, because of the accuracy and how straight the block is. So made in Ghana with German uh, standards, that's what they are basically saying. Uh, before I leave you, I'd just like to find out, th those patrons who will be coming through the Achimota Retail Center, yeah. are they going to get any good deals, sweet deals, discounts from you? Yeah, we are giving them a cool percent, 10 percent uh, discount if you are coming through just the Habitat Fair. It's a special package for all those who are coming through the Habitat Fair. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Manager for Sales and Marketing with DBS. Uh, industries so I'll, I'll, I'll just do you know what let me also get interactive with uh, very quickly with 
Echo Bank because they are also helping us bring this uh, to you and then we shall give way uh, for more talk. I'm going to barge in uh, my sincere apologies. Good morning. Good morning. So he is a top official with Echo Bank. Uh, please tell us your name. My name is Winston Wobill. Winston Wobill. And uh, he's going to be telling us you have a package when it comes to home ownership and all of that. What can you tell us about that? Yes, um, good morning to all your listeners. So we um, have various um, financing options for home ownership. Um, we have the mortgage option and then we also have um, the options where individuals can take loans, personal loans and we have consumer finance. You can take a loan for home items like your building materials. Even if you want a loan to buy land, we, can, we have all those options available for customers. So there's definitely something for every, everyone once you are here. Right. Mr. Warbill there giving us all the details. There's something for you, no matter your pocket. So come meet us here at the Achimota Retail uh, Center. It's the 13th Ecobank Joy News Habitat Fair. And we are waiting for you. too. Over to you, Bernice. Oh, Benjamin, dear. Yeah, I like the way you say Yabeyawawawa too. Well, uh, we'll leave it for now on the Joy News Habitat Fair, uh, Kobang Joy News Habitat Fair, but we'll be bringing you more. Uh, if you have time, just pass through the Achimota Retail Center and see things for yourself. Uh, while we prepare to wrap up the show today, let me just take a, some of your quick comments here. We put our question of the day. Do you think Ghana will ever win the fight against corruption? You know, we've been talking about corruption a lot this week. And um, yesterday we had a conversation with lawyer Martin Bibu and uh, uh, Mr. Senanu, who is, with, who is an anti-graft campaigner. So let's take your responses to this question. All right, uh, so, um, Kofi says we can win if the media learn to hold people responsible for their corrupt acts and stop generalizing. We can win if the judiciary is blind in applying the law. We can win if we all take it up to be whistleblowers to expose any corrupt act. Thank you, Kofi. Citizen says, first, the media must stop. Okay, I'm not sure what he means by this, but thank you for your comment, Citizen, when you say patronizing corruption. Yusuf Abendao says, the fight against corruption can never be won if the crooked and battered system created by citizens isn't fixed. Politicians are a product of the system. And Yuvinue says, yes, when we change our mentality, he argues it's all in our mind. Yaya Mohammed says, we may improve the fight against corruption, but it will take a while. Kofi Jr. says, we can't win a war against corruption. Corruption has been there since mankind was born. And uh, Benjamin alluded to this uh, earlier in the show uh, when he made reference to what uh, former President Kufu says. He continues to say, you don't win the fight against corruption with law, but rather from our homes. There is a saying, charity begins at home. And there are others who agree with him who say, let's tackle this problem from the next generation. Let's create a good value system for our kids. Okay. Ahovi Kwame says, yes, we can win the fight if only we can bring back Christ to our churches, homes, political arena and schools. We lack home training to be faithful from, um, uh, do you mean infancy? Well, it says, teach the young ones about faithfulness. Have a course every scholar must go through. Even in companies, workers must be disciplined. Kindness must be applauded than cash. Politicians should stop giving money to electorates to win their hearts. And if you listen to Blunt Thoughts with Benjamin today, uh, he, he spoke about democracy or monocracy. Paul says, yes, we can until we reform our judicial system. The day the judiciary decide not to protect the politician, that will mark the beginning of victory for us all. Nana Aristo. Okay, we'll skip that one. Braima Amadou Idrisu says, the society created the corrupt system. Until the values of the people change, the system will remain corrupt. And those are some of your answers to our question. If Ghana can ever win the fight against corruption and by way of uh, information the attention of world vision has been drawn to a live television broadcast by a group of people who operating under the names world vision fan club and world vision foundation on energy tv and ab tv satellite television stations since june 28 2022 a review of their video recordings of the programs indicates that these groups are using the logo and some images of World Vision with a view of getting interested people to register with various amounts of money in return for corresponding financial support. 
World Vision is concerned that its logo and images are being used by the so-called World Vision Fund Club and World Vision Foundation to collect money from the unsuspected public. World Vision therefore disassociates itself from the so-called World Vision Fund Club and World Vision Foundation and their operations and wishes to caution the general public as such. We call on the members of the World Vision Fund Club and World Vision Foundation to desist from using the logo, images and any other material for their activities forthwith. World Vision is a Christian relief development and advocacy organization dedicated to working with children, families and communities to overcome poverty and injustice. World Vision has been working in all regions of Ghana for the past 42 years. Please, for more information on World Vision, Vision Ghana, kindly visit their website. And hello, Ghana. Happy moment is here. A Storm World Cup Qatar 2022 with Storm Energy Drink, Puma Soft Drinks, and a Wick Drinking Water from Casa Perco Company Limited. Simply buy your favorite Storm Energy Drink, Puma Soft Drinks, and a Wick Drinking Water, and text the four-digit unique number on the neck of the bottle to short code star seven eight zero hash option two, star seven eight zero hash option two, and follow the prompt on all networks for free. Be one of the lucky winners to this year's World Cup in the monthly draw. You can also win TVs, fridges, microwave ovens, mobile phones, home theatres, free drinks and more instantly. Don't waste time. Grab a bottle of Storm Energy Drink, Puma Soft Drinks and Awake Drinking Water and let Storm Carter this World Cup. This promotion is on the NLA Caritas platform and this advert is FDA approved. Terms and conditions apply. Now, finally, a person who is not required to register for VAT may voluntarily apply to be registered. A voluntary applicant shall be registered as a taxable person where the Commissioner General is satisfied that the person has a fixed place of abode or business or reasonably believes that the person keeps proper accounting records related to any business activity carried on by that person and the person submits regular and reliable tax returns or reasonably believes the person is fit and proper uh, to be registered, okay? Uh, so a quick birthday wish, happy birthday to senior man Bernard Ose Ashong, uh, GFA, may God bless you abundantly uh, from Tosh, our camera technician. I'm supposed to do uh, one birthday wish, but the information is on my phone. I don't know if my director can help me. Uh, okay, so let's just, <laughs> we don't do this technically, but let me just project this, grab my phone and do that birthday wish or else I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna live in peace from here. Yao, can you help me? Yao, can you help me? All right, so let me quickly do this before I leave. All right, so happy birthday to Edward Kusi at Eddie Max Supermarket Domi Pillar 2. Edward Kusi at Eddie Max Supermarket Domi Pillar 2. And this is a happy birthday to you from uh, your dear friend. Uh, I'm sure you would know who the person is, just as I should tell you that. And thank you all for watching the show today. I'm grateful that you can make time to join us. Uh, Benjamin and myself will be back, God willing, on Monday with more discussions on what mattered to you. Please stay safe. Don't drink and drive. Have a good weekend and don't forget on Sunday, we bring you Ghana's Greats commemorative piece on the 10th anniversary of the passing of former President John Evans at Tamils. And at 11 a.m., we premiere our program or we launch our new program, Joe News Campus. Up next is News Desk. Do stay.